Welcome to the City Council's July 26th Special and Regular City Council Meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council Chambers in accordance with public health guidelines for in-person meetings and participating remotely to promote social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Jen Willison, City Council members Drew Combs and Cecilia Taylor. City Council member Ray Mueller will be joining later this evening. Staff present include Acting City Manager Dave Norris, City Attorney Nira Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Mayor Nash, and again, echoing a welcome to our special and regular meeting of July 26. For members of the public who are in attendance, when, if you have uh, public comment after the mayor calls for public comment on that item, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time. Mayor Nash, that concludes my introductions at this time. Thank you. Agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any request from city council members under city council member reports. Staff will pro be providing an update in consent item I-1. I would like to make a motion that we reorder the agenda in order to hear items J-1 and J-2 related to the ballot measure once the full city council is present. Is there a second on the table? City Council Member Taylor. I'll second. Thank you. City Clerk Karen, please state the motion and call for the vote. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Uh, before I read the motion, I'd like to uh, check in with Vice Mayor Willison. Did you have a comment or question? Uh, thank you, City Clerk Karen. Uh, just a clarifying question. Um, if we are, if we finish the agenda um, and um, Will we break and reconvene or will we continue on to those items? We will continue on to those items, depending, I mean, if it's a few minutes, then we may break and reconvene, but- um, Thank you for clarifying, otherwise. I was just curious. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor by Mayor Nash and a second by City Council Member Taylor to reorder the agenda in order to hear items J1 and J2 related to the ballot measure once the full city council is present. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Mueller absent. Thank you. Does the city council wish to pull or modify any other agenda items? Seeing none, we will um, proceed to closed session. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on the closed session item D1. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide public comment on item D1, conference with legal counsel for anticipated litigation, our first closed session item of this evening, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, Please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item D1. Seeing none, Mayor Nash, you may continue. The city council will now adjourn to closed session and report out immediately following the closed session. We are anticipating reconvening to the regular meeting at 6 p.m.
having a quorum of the city council we're turned to our virtual and in-person days. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. I would now like to reconvene the July 26th meeting and introduce city attorney Doherty for a report out from the closed session. Thank you, Mayor Nash. There is no reportable action. Thank you. The first proclamation tonight is recognizing July as Parks and Recreation Month. City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on item F1? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item F1, proclamation July as Parks and Recreation Month, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. Thank you. And our first speaker will be, oh, um, I have a Benji and Maya in the audience. Did you want to provide public comment on item F1? Give you a couple more seconds to click that hand one more time if you're interested. Okay. So let me do a final call for public comment on item F1, proclamation for Parks and Rec. Give me just one more moment. Um, Ms. Whiteley, um, just want to confirm that you wanted to provide comment on the park and rec. Um, I know that your item is next is F2. Hi, I apologize. I was just, um, Benji and Maya are my students and I just wanted to make sure that that was the next item. Perfect. Thank yes, you. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for confirming. <laughs> All right, so seeing no hands raised for item F1, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Whereas parks and recreation are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of Menlo Park, and whereas parks and recreation promote health and wellness, improving the physical and mental health of people who live near parks, and whereas parks and recreation promote time spent in nature, which positively impacts mental health by increasing cognitive performance and well being and alleviating illnesses such as depression attention deficit disorders and Alzheimer's and whereas parks and recreation encourage physical activities pro by providing space for popular sports, hiking trails, swimming pools, and many other activities designed to promote active lifestyles and whereas parks and recreation programming and education activities such as out of school time programming, youth sports and environmental education are critical to childhood development and whereas Parks and recreation increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas parks and recreation are fundamental to the environmental well being of our community, and whereas parks and recreation are essential and adaptable infrastructure that help our communities be resilient in the face of natural disasters and climate change. And whereas our parks and rec our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And whereas the US House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month. And whereas the city of Menlo Park recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, I, Betsy Nash, Mayor of the City of Menlo Park, hereby proclaim that July is recognized as Parks and Recreation Month in the City of Menlo Park. I would like to introduce Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhart, to accept the proclamation. Thank you, Mayor, for the proclamation. It's an honor and a privilege to accept it on behalf of the hardworking staff in the Library and Community Services and Public Works Departments. Thank you. Thank you. The second presentation tonight is recognition of the Rethink Waste Trash to Art Contest. 
Do we have any public comment on this item F2, City Clerk Karen? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to comment on our second uh, presentation item F2, the recognition of Rethink Waste Trash to Art Contest, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And if any uh, students are in the audience who wish to be promoted, uh, please engage that hand feature as well. Okay, Team 10 alumni, if you're logged on, I can't see anyone, but if you're logged on, go ahead and raise your hand and share our work. So Lewis Smith, confirming student, fabulous. Go ahead and promote. Uh, Lila Murphy, fabulous. All right, so you guys should be able to engage your webcams and microphones and feel free to describe what you guys did here. Why don't you start us off, Lewis? Uh, so we took like trash and stuff and then we used less than 10% of not trash and we made it into art, hence the name Trash to Art. And we made a beehive because Saw Hill made a prototype and it was a beehive and our class voted for that rather than other stuff. So. Thanks, Lewis. Lila, you wanna, you wanna uh, share a little more? Um, well, we split into groups, people making bees who then went into partnerships and then people working on the hive, but then the people working on the hive um, broke into a different group and then half the people started working on the tree and it was very hectic and there was a lot of trash and the room was a mess and it was stressful. Maya and Benji, I know you're, you're in the audience. Um, would you like to share anything too? And if there's any other Team 10 alumni kiddos, now's your time to shine. No longer see Benji and Maya in the list. Okay, they may have had to hop off. Um, so this is, uh, this is a project that I've done with a few classes in the past and um, we, we love turning trash into art. The kids did lots of different prototypes for what uh, group project or class project they'd like to submit. And then they had opportunities to explain and share their prototypes with the class. The class then voted on the one that they wanted to work on. And they did this project entirely by themselves. The gluing, the cutting, uh, deciding who would be working on what, the organizing, all of it. And they did an incredible job. They called it Honey World um, because it's a continuation of the project-based learning unit that they did as third graders to save the bees. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for sharing your project. It's awesome. And thank you, Lewis and Lila. Sounds like a really fun class with Ms. Whiteley. Really appreciate it. Uh, Vice Mayor, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Lewis and Lila and Ms. Whiteley. Um, my son and daughter were Laurel Squirrels and they did the Save the Bees project. And um, I hope you had a lot of fun with that project. And it's so amazing what you were able to put together as a team. Um, and really repurposing trash. And I hope it inspires you to help clean up the world and, and make it really beautiful. So thank you and keep it up. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us. So next we will go on to public comment and before we start that, I do want to um, 
remind anyone who was not here at the beginning that we have um, reordered the agenda so that the ballot initiative um, items J1 and J2 will be coming at um, later in the agenda so that we can have a full council address um, that item, hopefully. So under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I will call for public comment at the appropriate time for members of the public to address the city council on any item under agenda sections, advisory body member reports, consent calendar, public hearing, regular business, information items, closed session. City Clerk Karen, please call for general public comment. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time for any member of the public who wishes to speak on an item not on tonight's agenda, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Lindsay Rake, followed by Elizabeth McCarthy. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Nash and members of the council. Yes, my name is Lindsay Reich and I live in San Mateo. Um, I've spoken here before on the Burgess issue, but I'm here tonight to speak about the Nicholson therapy pool closure in San Mateo. Um, I also forgot to mention that I am the CEO of Warm Water Wellness, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're newly minted. We are a group of former therapy pool users who have joined together um, in our efforts to try to encourage Sutter to reopen this therapy pool. Um, just a little background. Uh, I, I think someone from our group spoke last week, but I'll just reiterate some of our main points is that uh, this is a facility, a unique facility with the main feature being that it has a ramp that descends into the water. And it is the only warm water therapy pool on the peninsula that has, that has a ramp. And for mobility impaired individuals, this is key. This is, this is absolutely key for being able to access the facility. <laughs> and, um, and of course, the warmer temperature is also therapeutic. Um, this, this facility was used by uh, children with special needs, pregnant women, seniors, disabled individuals, um, patients recovering from surgery. Sutter is a nonprofit organization that um, accepted $850 million in CARES funding to, for the purposes of combating uh, pandemic, for the purposes of combating closures during the pandemic. Um, we just had a rally last Sunday that was hosted by County Supervisor uh, Canapa, and we had over 100 activists, uh, all, mostly former us users, show up. Um, we also had uh, the Vice Mayor uh, of Millbrae, uh, Vice Mayor Pappen showed up, and other uh, public officials, government officials included uh, two members of the Peninsula Healthcare District, Helen Galligan, Frank Pag Pagliaro, and, um, and also uh, a council member from um, the San Carlos Council. Anyway, I'm here tonight to ask you to, uh, to encourage you to please pass a resolution. Um, eight, eight city councils um, have done so, and we have three more that are upcoming. Um, and in that list are the county has uh, county of San Mateo, city of San Mateo, city of Millbrae, and there's a long list. And we've sent you a package, um, and we've spoken before. And I'd really encourage you to please prioritize this. Um, it's it's an opportune time given the momentum that we have. We had quite a, a handful of articles in the paper today we, about the rally: Daily Journal, SF Gate, um, and uh, we had two um, segments on the news on KPIX five and Cron four on Sunday after the rally. So um, this is a great time for you to get on board with a resolution. We'd be ha we've, we've sent you a sample template and are happy to answer any questions um, you may have about this. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Forgive me, we're using a new timer. So our next speaker will be Elizabeth McCarthy 
followed by Carolyn. Hi, City Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Elizabeth McCarthy calling from 1920 Minalto across the street from Cafe Zoe. Um, I spoke with you a few weeks ago. I just wanted to give you an update and um, I'll pose my question first. My question, just in a general sense, is what can be done when a business owner defies code enforcement? Um, or I guess more specifically, what can, if if anything, what, if anything, can the city council do to help uh, to clarify um, this issue? So um, Cafe Zoe for the last two weeks has been operating outdoor amplified music concerts without a permit. Um, this is in defiance to what the code enforcement officer told her, told the owner on June 1st and July 19th. So, um, Finally, when it happened on again on July 22nd, very reluctantly, my neighbor and I both independently called the police department because this was a code violation. Um, the officer said that he was aware of the notation made in the, the business's record that um, the business is, is to be cited if there's another violation. Um, but then he said that he was shown an email uh, from the Menlo Park Police Chief to Cafe Zoe saying that it was fine. So I'm just wondering how we can get everyone uh, very clear on, on the code, on the permitting requirement. It seemed really clear to code enforcement and it seemed very clear to um, city planning um, not clear to the cafe owner though, because she continues to have these concerts. There was also a front page article in the Palo Alto Daily Post recently where the owner of Cafe Zoe was quoted, I think kind of defiantly as uh, saying that she was going to continue with these outdoor concerts without a permit. Um, and this is in contrast to the uh, Menlo Park planner who was quoted as saying that the cafe does need a permit. So I'm just wondering, just generally speaking, what if anything can city council do when a business owner defies code enforcement like this? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Carolyn and Carolyn will ask you to state your last name for the record, if you would, followed by Wendy Schindler. Uh, my, my name is Carolyn Ordonez. I'm in Living District 2. Okay, thank my, you. I need to comment on the proposal to push traffic from the proposed apartments at the former flood school site through Haven House on Van Buren Road and into the Flood Triangle neighborhood. The Flood Triangle neighborhood already has too much cut through traffic. Suburban Park does not have any cut through traffic. The cut through traffic in the flood triangle is only going to get worse with all the projects in the pipeline. Flood Park is to be rebuilt and open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. There is a pedestrian gate within the neighborhood that potentially will draw drop off traffic adjacent to Haven House, even though stopping here at all is not allowed. The proposed housing in District 2 and parts of District 3 includes 62 units on Willow Road for the VA, the USGS site, the SRI site, and all the housing coming from District 1 will impact District 2 and Bay Road and Van Buren Road. Also, I'm disgusted that anyone is proposing a connection through Haven House at all. Right now, the road in and out of Haven House is split by a large oak tree. The entry is intimate and feels safe. Front doors and windows are right next to the road. Introducing a road connecting 45 apartments will be very disruptive to this sensitive site. Haven House has been a good neighbor to the flood triangle and very needed to help for 23 families. Myself and many neighbors do not want a connection to the pros proposed apartment building to our neighborhood and through Haven House. We're not opposed to housing, just the connection. 
Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Wendy Schindler. And this will also be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. So Wendy, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you may do that at this time. So Wendy, we're unable to hear you. Um, if you're using a headset, you may wanna try to unplug that or disconnect that. Um, if you're not using a headset, you may wanna try uh, plugging or connecting one now. Okay, we did have another hand raised. So Wendy, I'm gonna come right back to you. Um, and just give you a couple of minutes here to see if we can get that microphone working. And I'm gonna go to Ole Adjison. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thanks. Good evening, Council. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk. I'm Ole Ayerson. I live in Allied Arts. I grew up in Denmark, but I've been here many years now. I want to talk about leadership and I want to talk about climate change and how it relates to leadership. So climate change is, uh, as we all know, it's a global problem. It doesn't matter where you emit your CO2, it'll end up anywhere and everywhere. And uh, with it being a global problem, sooner or later, everyone will need to help solve the problem. It's also a, a huge, huge problem uh, because the burning of fossil fuels is so ingrained in all aspects of our lives and economy and the city and our buildings. Um, so it's not going to be easy. Everybody's going to make a, a very large effort. But when you have something that's both difficult and global, we, we know the places or towns or even countries that will be laggards. It's just inevitable that somebody will be lagging behind. But the flip side of being having laggards is that we can have leaders and we can have leadership. And it is essential for a place like Menlo Park where we have both the ambition and the ability to make change that we rise up to this need for someone showing leadership. I think I would like Menlo Park to make it to the absolute front and to be a highly visible leader in taking action on climate change. And I urge city council and any resident to help make this happen. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I'm going to be returning to Wendy Schindler. Wendy, are you able to unmute yourself and engage that microphone? Okay, Wendy, we're unable to hear you. You can also email uh, comments to our city council at city.council at memopark.org. Um, I do believe that will conclude our general public comment at this time, Mayor Nash. Thank you. We'll now move on to advisory body re member reports. According to city council policy CC 22004, a representative of all advisory bodies at a regularly scheduled city council meeting must provide annual work plan report out. For item H1, Receive and File Environmental Quality Commission Progress Report, I would like to introduce Sustainability Manager, Rebecca Lucky. Good evening, 
Mayor Nash, Vice Mayor Wilson, and council members and members of the public, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce this item, which our Environmental Quality Chair Cabot will be presenting on, and um, we'll be updating the council on the activities and kind of looking forward on what they'll be working on um, over the course of the next six months. So without further ado, Chair Cabot, I will change the slides for you. Let me start the presentation as well. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sustainability Manager Lucky and members of the council. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and to present the quarterly report from the EQC. This, I believe this is our first one in 2022, so we'll do a little bit of catching up. Next. So during the course of 2022, we have had a, uh, several new commissioners join. We've had three new members joining and four members have rolled off the commission. So our new commissioner, commission members are Nancy LaRocca Headley, Jeffrey Lynn and Jeff Schmidt. And we like to wish a thanks and farewell to Deborah Martin, James Payne, Josie Gaylord and Ryan Price, who all served on the commission for years. So we've got a full, a full slate of commissioners, and so we're moving on. Uh, the, the climate science update, it kind of goes on around us all the time. We hear it through the news, and we're seeing it in the weather and the effects of things on prices. But basically, the International Panel on uh, climate change, the scientists from the, the United Nations body and the International Energy Agency have agreed the current fossil fueled machineries, normal lifetime emissions will push the climate past uh, up to the two degree Celsius limit. So that is as far as they were ever comfortable letting the climate um, uh, change unravel. So they want to try to hold below two degrees Celsius, and they have found there's no more climate space below the two degree level for newly installed fossil fired equipment, including things we would do here in Menlo Park, like replacing our existing equipment. We've, they're pointing out to us, we've used up all the waiting time there might have ever been, and we are now deep into the action time. Next. So the implications for cities of that kind of news is that cities need to recognize that society must be pivoting to uh, in our area where we have clean electricity to the electric alternatives at the time of new construction, like our reach code now does. And at the time of additions and alterations to buildings and at the time of replacement of devices, if we're going to hold to the two degree level, because the existing equipment will drive us all the way up to two, and it's any replacements that drive us over. All of the replacements are, are over the top of the two degree mark. So if we wanted to hold below the two degree mark, we would have to be replacing things before they burn out. And then we also need to look at other viable intervention points to help people uh, make the right choices going forward to have a decarbonized future. And we're noticing that almost all climate action plans, these caps we call them, and equivalent policies are not keeping up with the evolving science on climate change. So it's a fast moving science and uh, we've been slow on the policy, but we need to catch up. Examples of what slows us down are things like sequencing. When we, when we feel the need to add steps into a plan ahead of taking action without uh, doing that, that extra sequence. So next. So Menlo Park's Climate Action Plan really closed that ambition gap. So we, uh, the council, really set a, a very good science-based target to get to a 90% reduction in emissions with 10% more reduction in um, carbon through planting and, and soil fixing, things like that. And those ambitions are set on target for meeting the one degree, one and a half degree rise. But 
now we've got those good goals, but we still have an action gap and an achievement gap. The action gap is that we haven't yet developed the policies that will hit the goal. And the achievement gap is since we haven't got the policies in place, the, the community's not yet following them to hit those goals. Next. So, so I'd like to review a few months of the EQC activities. Next. So we've been working on the council's uh, climate action goal set, including that net zero by 2030. We've been working on implementation of climate action plan, especially the first year, that 2020 and 2021 fiscal year, first year activities are ongoing, but more are needed. So we haven't really added activities to this first set of six that we knew needed to be added to get on track to meeting them. City Council recommended in August uh, that public outreach ahead of additional actions be taken when we're looking at existing buildings for this uh, climate action plan goal one, to electrify 95% of existing buildings by the year 2030. EQC members have been doing some outreach like um, hosting electrification workshops and Earth Day events and setting those kind of things up. And community members have been trying to get things going with a, a 350 Menlo Park citizens team, things like that. So activities are starting up that uh, could be called outreach. Next. Uh, this chart just shows the six, uh, those first climate action plan goals adopted in the left column are the six goals numbered. And the first one deals with converting 95% of buildings to all electric by 2030. The second one is increasing electric vehicle sales. So they become 100% of new vehicle sales purchased in Menlo Park by 2025 and decreasing gasoline sales 10% each year. Number three is expanding the access to EV charging at multifamily and commercial sites. Number four is to reduce vehicle miles traveled, BMT, by about 25% or something set by the Complete Streets Commission. And number five, the staff have been working very diligently on and made a lot of progress. That's eliminating the use of fossil fuels from municipal operations. So they've been working on plans for those and also uh, following the construction of the new community center, which will be all electric. And number six is to develop that climate, act, climate adaptation plan for sea level rise and flooding protection. So activities are going on in all areas, but more outreach is needed, especially in climate action plan number one. Next. So uh, among the activities, Commissioner Evans assisted in developing the city's low income housing electrification project and looking at some of the city's low income housing and how to get it electrified. Commissioner London has been assisting with the Beyond Gasoline Initiative focused on action two. And then California and other states are adopting new building codes on a three-year cycle. And so the action time is this year for cities adopting the new 2022 code that becomes effective January 1st. And then Commissioner Schmidt has been assisting with uh, uh, developing a new urban, urban tree canopy master plan. Next. So the city's also been looking at partnering with leaders, uh, like uh, the, the EQC recommended that Menlo Park join the ICLE race to zero while maintaining our 2030 carbon neutral goal, but further recommending that, that the council request creating a subgroup of cities that have this more ambitious 2030 carbon neutral goal. And ICLE has followed up by creating that subgroup. So now there will be a group of peer cities who are on the same track as, as Menlo Park is looking at. So we, that gives us a group to work with. Next. So building reach code recommendations have been something that we hear a lot about and talk about in the Environmental Quality Commission. And so we recommended proposed new construction reach codes and existing building electrification measures with ad additional advice to council to consider returning with uh, 
with new actions once several support features have been put in place. And those support features are, are being in place now with the partnership with Block Power, being able to have that entity offering electrification services and with now zero interest financing being uh, rolled out by Peninsula Clean Energy to have that financing avenue available. There are different pieces falling into place that will ease the, the path forward. And then following are some specific measures about the proposed existing building reach codes. We, the commission was suggesting that some in lieu fees be added so that if, if uh, community members need exceptions to meeting the reach code, that they have an avenue to pay part of the, the avoided costs they're trying to avoid by not following those recommendations into a fund that helps do other electrification. Also that Item B, parking lot alterations require EV charging to be designed and installed and to require 100% EV charging equipment installed for new construction so that new parking spaces have access to at least low, low power EV charging to be able to fill up during the daytime when there is lots of available sunshine on the grid. Also, we've, we've been hearing about the need to streamline the permit process. And so we'll be looking at that alongside staff and to consider hardship exemptions for when it's difficult to make the change to electrification for some physical reason at the facility. And then also we were looking at, at establishing a simpler, more impactful trigger for when to implement electrification. And so using a single factor trigger, like any alteration or addition larger than 200 square feet would require the action towards electrification. So to meet the Paris Accord, it'd be towards full building electrification. And then uh, item G was to consider a replace at end of life requirement for for appliances so that when they burn out or when you're adding new air conditioning, either way that it be one of the efficient electric heat pump alternatives or an electrified alternative. And then uh, lastly, item H was to consider a long lasting ordinance versus the three year uh, adoption cycle type that we're on right now. Next, please. So the important actions we're looking at for 2022 are adoption of electrification reach codes pursuant to Climate Action Plan Action Item 1, so electrifying 95% of buildings. And then also continuing, new construction reach codes are needed again. And we think that it makes sense to remove the costly exemptions that are created that, that create expensive retrofit situations. And so we may feel that creating exemptions provides relief, but it really just kicks the can down the road and makes a more expensive project for the next person to have to deal with at the same facility in retrofitting the device in. So reach codes are needed for remodels and additions, et cetera, to meet the the climate targets, and they're also needed to prevent the costly installation of fossil-fired equipment and avoid implementing one-way air conditioners when for a few dollars more, the air conditioner can be a two-way type that harvests heat from the yard and produces warmth in the winter. And then, then we're looking at that issue of in-lieu fees, and we think that may make sense to assist applicants with difficult situations. Next. So we've heard a number of concerns at our meetings from the community, next. They've raised concerns uh, about climate change and about it having a high level of urgency and them not seeing action at the pace that they feel is needed. We've heard concerns about climate equity and climate action equity and the affordability of moving forward. How are the, you know, what are the different alternatives buildings and people will have for, for becoming uh, climate beneficial. And they're looking at accelerated progress on the climate action plan is needed to meet science-based goals. So we're hearing that pressure from the community and I'm transmitting it along to you. And then we, we've also heard about uh, you know, ideas for what can be done for the inclusion of volunteers outside of commissioners to help address climate action in Menlo Park. And there's been some desire of citizens to volunteer for assisting the city with climate preservation efforts. And one, one interesting parallel to note is there's a Friends of the Library volunteer group 
And we wonder, is that a model for something like a Friends of the Climate group that would partner with the city to work on climate preservation? Uh, the citizens helped organ or did organize themselves <laughs> the We Love Earth Festival and invited the city to attend and the city was able to attend and table at that event. Uh, the concerns we've been hearing also have involved gas powered leaf blowers and interest in dine in restaurants using reusable foodware instead of just compostable foodware. So that's another new issue raised by some citizens. And then we, we hear about uh, heritage, eat, <laughs> heritage tree issues and preserving the overall urban canopy. Next. So looking forward, we're, we think we'll be mostly engaged in pursuing uh, measures to respond to the urgency of the need for climate preservation activity and community engagement. Looking at the role of the EQC and commissioners to further educate uh, and to assist with, with pursuing climate action plan goals, to update the climate action plan going beyond the six first year actions of 2020 and seeing what are the, the additional actions that ought to be considered by council. And then making more progress on CAP actions one, two, four, and six. Next. Well, thank you very much for listening to, to all this update, and I welcome any response you have. Thank you so much, Chair Cabot. That was very informative. Um, City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item H1, receive and file environmental quality commission progress report to engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine for any member of the public in person wishing to comment on item H1. We ask that you step up to the podium now. And our first speaker will be Crystal Hernandez followed by Zachary Mayer. Hello, council members. My name is Crystal Hernandez, and I am a resident of the Bay Area, a volunteer with Actera, and a student at Skyline Community College. I support their proposed reach codes and new outline goals to prevent going over the two degree threshold. EV charging access for multifamily homes uh, can get us to our climate goals. This will also provide EV equity to underserved communities who often bear the brunt of climate change without being the main perpetrators. Forcing people to live in gas power units exposes them to higher levels of indoor air pollution. During emergencies, it takes longer to get power back on to gas homes as opposed to electric homes. And most importantly, as the price of renewable energy continues to drop, fossil fuels will become more expensive. So it's important to make sure all homes are covered under this plan. Lastly, as our state and the world now suffers from wildfires, which undeniably impact health, climate change, and the environment, we can understand the connection and importance of making EV more accessible for everyone. Diverting gas guzzling cars off our roads through EV accessibility will also help to mitigate and achieve our emission reduction goals as a state. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Zachary Mayer followed by Simon Da Silva. Uh, hi all and good evening. My name is Zachary Meyer and I'm a longtime resident of Menlo Park as well as a student and an intern at Menlo Spark. Menlo Park is currently not on track to, to meet the climate goals set by the city, state and nation. The city of Menlo Park needs to pick up the pace and adapt policies to reduce and ultimately eliminate fossil fuel use in the city. According to the IPCC, we are currently not on track to limit warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. Through collective effort and local action, we may, we may be able to get on track. Right now, my future looks grim. Rising sea levels that are expected to cost the city of Menlo Park millions and increased air pollution that will kill hundreds. I want a future I can look forward to, so that's why I'm here today. 
to ask the city of Menlo Park to step up and get on track on meeting the climate goals set out by the city, state, and nation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Salmon Da Silva, followed by Robert Gould. Hi, Council. My name is Salmon Da Silva. I am a high schooler uh, from Palo Alto. As Commissioner Cabot reported that city efforts are subpar to achieve cap goals, I asked myself why we insist on setting climate goals that we don't strive to maintain. Is it just to placate youth like me who want to see aggressive climate policy or to actually take steps in the right direction? And based off of the Block Power Partnership and the movement to electrify 95% of existing buildings, Council has proven that they are stepping up to the plate, taking climate change head on and working for issues that work towards remediating disparities that plague historically marginalized groups and youth. Let's get some strong reach codes in place that tackle existing building electrification. Let's get off gas stoves. Let's take so many actions that make our community both more resilient and sustainable. So why, I ask, do we begin to give up this objective now? Why fall short of a goal so early in our campaign for our youth and environmental justice communities? It seems to me that we have one path forward, continue fighting and committing more resources to fight for CAP goals, for future, for equity, and for our youth. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Robert Gould, followed by Nicole Kemney. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Bob Gould. I'm, uh, I work at the uh, Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment at UCSF, and I'm president of San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility. And in the latter capacity, I'm speaking on behalf of hundreds of health professionals throughout the Bay Area who support rapid uh, building electrification as a part of our need to deal with the health impacts of air pollution but more forthrightly about the, the global crisis we're facing with uh, global warming. And I wanna thank uh, Mr. Kabat and, and the committee for seeing that problem uh, head on in, in the sense of not looking for reducing two degrees, but looking towards goals of 1.5 degrees, which are clearly uh, even at that level, not really enough for the rapidly accelerating climate crisis that we have. I'd also want to mention that rapid steps towards uh, addressing our climate crisis are also supported by many health professional organizations, such as the American Public Health Association, the American Medical Association, and California Medical Association. And that strong support is also echoed by members of my local organization, Santa Clara County Medical Association, and many physicians within San Mateo uh, County Medical Association. So um, we know that, uh, and I want to just echo what Mr. Bot said, the findings of the International Panel on Climate Change are very clear that we need to take rapid steps at all levels of our uh, society because of the grievous health impacts that we're seeing, the wildfires, et cetera. I, I want to uh, salute the committee for uh, addressing uh, uh, and, and recommending new construction reach codes so we get rid of the costly exemptions. And also that uh, the committee is, is also gearing uh, its focus on equity in terms of low income members of the, our society who are most susceptible to the uh, issues of climate change and need support. It is disappointing that our national government is not providing leadership in terms of the failure of Build Back Better to provide the funds to have a just transition like, that we need but all the more reason that we really need to, at the local and state levels, do the most that we can, because uh, the time is really up for us in terms of future uh, generations. And in that sense, I support the, the uh, report that you all have joined ICLE, because I think we need that type of cross-collaboration among many municipalities to move as rapidly as we can to deal with our climate emergency. So thank you very much for your work. We just need to do much more as we all know. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be 
Nicole Kimney, followed by Alex Wagenfeld. And this will be the final call for public comment on item H1. Um, hello, thank you, um, Mayor Nash and City Council. This is Nicole Kemeny. I'm a longtime resident of Menlo Park and a longtime climate advocate. Uh, I really just wanted to speak today to express my gratitude to Tom Cabot and the EQC for really doing such a beautiful job uh, distilling a complicated and pressing topic down to really bite-sized, clear chunks that we can tackle, um, and also making the urgency clear. I think um, Tom did a great job of laying out how, as a society, we have procrastinated until we have no time left to procrastinate, and uh, we've, we've used up all of the buffer that we may have had. Um, and really ignored all of the warnings that we were getting for years and decades. Um, and now we have a really enormous task ahead of us, but we haven't got any choice. We have to do these difficult things just to maintain the two degree um, limit in rise of temperature, which honestly, it wasn't isn't the goal we really need to stay under 1.5 um but certainly if we don't tackle this with haste we're going going over the two degrees and it's absolutely not acceptable look around right now and look at the state of the world and anybody that consumes news in any form is aware of the fact that the things that we were warned about are happening all around us sooner and more severely than we expected. If anything, when all the trend lines are going in the wrong direction, I think it tells you that it's time to get on it and, um, and that there isn't a minute to waste. So we have it within our power um, to take the steps that were outlined so nicely and so clearly. We're lucky we don't have to figure out what to do. And the EQC has done it for us and set it out. And now we just need to really be serious about walking the path. So thank you, all my gratitude to the EQC. I'm finished with my comments, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our final speaker will be Alex Wagenfeld. Hi. My name is Alex Wagenfeld. I'm 16 years old. I'm a rising junior at the Nueva Upper School, a lifelong resident of the Bay Area, and an intern at Menlo Spark this summer. My generation has had the terrifying and horrific problem of the climate crisis dumped on us, and that's why I'm here today. I'm very passionate about our beautiful planet, and I hope for my kids to enjoy the world someday like we all do now. There is a lack of urgency to transition to a greener future. Although some pol policies are being passed that try to attack the problem, they are often insufficient in, address, in addressing our goals to deal with the climate crisis. I have seen and understand that most of the US is nowhere near where we are with carbon neutrality, nor are they moving in that direction, but we can only hope other communities across the US follow our lead in the future. We are the climate leaders here at Men in Menlo Park and in the Bay Area. When we, when we make change, others follow in our wake. But if we are unable to meet the necessary carbon neutrality goals, it can be expected that other counties probably won't be at, won't either. We are the leaders and we need to lead. So I urge you to continue to inspire the younger generation and make change. I hope we all will get back on track with our climate action plan. I urge you to make commi a commitment to at least one or two of the major measures that actively reduce fossil fuel use and pollution this year, not waiting until next year. I'm proud to say that Menlo Park has continually shown the rest of America what change should look like and what can be done at a local level. On behalf of my generation, I ask you to do all you can to continue that leadership and create a livable world for our generation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mayor Nash, seeing no further hands, you may continue. Thank you. 
And we will now open for a city council discussion. Is there anyone who um, wants to start? So I guess I will um, just thank the EQC and Chair Tom Cabot and also all the speakers who I think um, so eloquently describe the dire crisis that we're in and the effect it will have on future generations. But I also believe that we really need to, another week, have to be taking action as a council now. We have to be leading the locally and beyond. Um, we're already seeing the effects with the weather, with um, the drought, um, the fire, the sea level rise, and it's affecting Menlo Park. It's affecting our District One community the most. Um, it also it is something where we need to look at the health impacts of the gas we are using in our households and realize that, that it, we will help with asthma rates, we will help with um, just many illnesses by transitioning to electric. And it will also be good for not only for the individuals and families, but also for um, our planet. And I think that um, the EQC has just done a fabulous job of leading the city and um, showing us as a council the direction. And I am very grateful for that and hope that we um, take a good look at the presentation and um, really, run down this path as fast as we really pursue this, um, the measures that they are talking about. And I think that um, outreach is very, very important. We have not done enough of that. And um, there's always more to do with outreach, um, but I hope that we can um, work with the EQC, with the um, city um, staff is right there um, working on this and really make a difference. Uh, Vice Mayor Wollison. Um, thank you, Mayor Nash. And um, thank you to EQC Commission Chair Tom Cabot um, and to the EQC, both current and former members who first worked so hard to uh, present an ambitious climate action plan a few years ago that um, delivered what it would take to have a sustainable future. And the plan was really about leadership. And I know several of the speakers tonight, um, you know, really talked about, are we gonna be leaders? And that Menlo Park needs to be a leader. And that's what our, the theme of the climate action plan really is And this concept. I know a lot of you know that the nonprofit Menlo Spark, the concept that Menlo Park has so much talent and so much influence um, that it can spark uh, action beyond its borders throughout California and then, and then really have it take off. And so um, I think that's what this is all about. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, when they think of the city council and what the city council should or shouldn't be doing, um, you know, we think about, you know, making sure that the trash is picked up and that the parks are clean and that um, the downtown um, is nice. And of course, those are all things that our city needs to be doing. Um, but sometimes people don't realize um, some of these larger issues that seem kind of aspirational or leadership, they really are about um, Menlo Park residents today. Um, uh, my neighbor's son was supposed to go on a camping trip to Yosemite and it got completely rerouted and changed. These impacts are happening to our residents today. And that's a very like flippant example of a, of a, a nice to have moment, but our lives are continually getting more and more impacted now. And as we hear from our youth and we think about our future, um, I think we kind of don't have any other option than to lead. So I just wanna commend um, the EQC. I wanna support the leadership um, vision that they have put forward. And I hope that the council will continue to act in a way um, to create a sustainable future um, for our community. Um, I think we owe it to our residents 
um, to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Willison. Any other comments? All right, thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to reopen uh, the general public comment item G for the um, person who was having some um, challenges with the mic. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, we will be reopening our general public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. For those of you participating virtually, please press that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline, you can press star nine. For any member of the public who is in person, you may step up to the podium now. All right, and so we are going to be returning to Wendy Schindler. Wendy, if you're able to engage your microphone. Oh, I think we're able to hear you, Wendy. Oh, you can hear me. Awesome. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you for your patience with all that. <laughs> um, let's see. Good evening, City Council members. Uh, my name is Wendy Schindler, and I live on uh, the Bay Road section of District 2. So I spent a lot of time this weekend chatting with some of my neighbors and trying to wrap my head around the many and varied proposed and in-process development projects being considered for our near or on our street. Um, some of you will know what I mean when I say our neighborhoods in District 2 and even District 1, some of us have sometimes felt like we're the Menlo Park neighborhoods the time and the city left behind. We can, we can um, in the past, we can remember being ignored by the city. And sometimes we feel as if uh, we're a dumping ground for projects others don't want in their neighborhoods. Not everybody feels that way, some of us do. Uh, you have only to look at the amount of development that's been crammed into District uh, 1 and the long list of potential uh, development sites now being considered in or within striking distance of uh, District 2 Bay Road. To name a few, there's Reimagine Flood Park, the VA Affordable Housing for Vets, the former flood school high density um, project housing, um, several potential sites on Bohannon and Campbell, the SRI site, USGS, and, and this is really just to name a few. Um, here's what I'd like to leave you, here's what I'd like you to consider this evening. It's what I'd like to leave you with. When you think of developments you'd like to see happen in any of our small residential only neighborhoods, such as large parks with many sports fields and courts where every possible amenity has been shoehorned in, where parking is insufficient and the push for seven days of ball games is coming mostly from outside of our neighborhoods. And when you think about adding high density affordable housing to our neighborhoods, if it includes, the four, if it includes a lot of floors, if it has 90 or more units and potentially will have more at market rate units with the possibility of office space and commercial amenities to keep developers and other investors interested. Ask, ask yourselves, do these projects fit on these sites as designed? Um, when you think of these two side-by-side -side developments, please consider the context. We're a string of three small, older, resident-only neighborhoods. We already live with school and work, rush hour traffic, cut through traffic, and speeding. We don't have full sidewalks with curbs or ramps. We lack proper signage for parking, um, traffic, and um, so I'll just cut through to this. Please understand we have no philosophical issues with these pro projects, but we hope the forces that will be will consider them in context of their impacts on our neighborhoods. When you consider sites in our small residential neighborhoods for development, ask yourselves, as currently designed, are these the right development projects for our neighborhoods? Would you be okay with the, this unchecked development in your neighborhood? Thank you so much for the opportunity to weigh in tonight. Thank you for your comment. And that concludes uh, general public comment, Mayor Nash. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent calendar 
Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Heron, please provide the update to item I-1. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So um, I did want to just pull item I-1, except the city council meeting minutes for June 28th and July 12th there were some um, grammatical errors, some spelling errors, and some clarification that was provided. Um, when I look at the June 28th minutes, I did modify the arrival time of city council member Mueller. Again, there was some spelling uh, errors that were corrected as well as some clarification for item G2, which is related to the Burgess pool operator agreement. And again, that was for the June 28th minutes. On the July 12th minutes, uh, very similar. There were some grammatical and some spelling errors. And then there was um, additional clarification provided on item J, which was city council member reports regarding um, considering amending the block power partnership agreement uh, or resolution. And that does conclude my update. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, city council did receive these at uh, about 4 p.m and I do have printed copies available. Thank you very much. Is there any city council discussion or questions on the consent calendar? City Clerk Heron, would you please call for public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our consent calendar items, I one city council minutes, I two resolution for continuing conducting city council and advisory body meetings remotely. I three the authorization for the city manager to enter into a master professional agreements for geotechnical and civil engineer services. I four resolution approving the exception of a 180 day waiting period for hiring a CalPERS retired annuitant. I five authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for automated water meter infrastructure project, or I-6, a resolution to reduce posted speed limits in school zones, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If you are participating in chambers, please step up to the podium now. So this will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items I-1 through I-6. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Is there a motion um, or, or, well, is there, Council Member Taylor? Thank you, Mayor Nash. I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar with the changes provided by the city clerk. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, could you please state the motion and call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Taylor and a second by Vice Mayor Willison to approve the consent calendar with the updates presented to item I-1. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Mueller absent. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're moving on to public hearings. Public hearings are a public are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. As was stated earlier, we are going to hold J1 and J2 um, till later in hopes that we will have a full council to hear that. So at this point, we will um, proceed to item J3. Um, this public hearing is J3, consider and adopt a resolution approving a re revision to a previously approved vesting tentative map to change the expiration date of the map associated with the mixed use development project located at 706 and 706 716 Santa Cruz Avenue. 
To introduce the item is Associate Planner Fatin Khan. Good evening, uh, Mayor Nash. I do have a, a short presentation uh, for you and council members. However, there is no update to the staff report. Good evening, Mayor Nash, Vice Mayor Willison, and Council members. I am uh, Associate Planner Fatin Khan with the Community Development De uh, Department. I'll be giving a quick overview of the 706 to 716 Santa Cruz Avenue vesting tentative map extension. The project is located at 706 to 716 Santa Cruz Avenue, which is within the El Camino Real Downtown Specific Plan Zoning District of the city. This shows a rendering of the uh, previously approved project. As a brief overview of the project history, the project was approved for architectural control for a new three-story mixed-use building with a vesting tentative map removal of an on-street parking along Chestnut Street, a variance to exceed the height limit for proposed skylights, and a BMR housing agreement by City Council on January 28, 2020. On June 13, the Planning Commission approved revisions to the variance to extend the expiration date by two years and recommended the City Council to approve a two-year extension for the vesting tentative map. The vesting tentative map is associated with major subdivision for the four residential condominium units and one commercial area with rights reserved to allow up to 10 commercial condominiums as, as these have a two year validity from approval date. The applicant is now requesting a two year extension from the expiration date. The vesting tentative map has been reviewed by the city's engineering division and has been found to comply with the provisions of the state sub subdivision map act and the city subdivision ordinance subject to the previous conditions of approval. The planning commission recommends the city council to adopt a resolution to approve a two year extension of the vesting tentative map, which would allow the applicant to secure funding and allow the approved project to be implemented. This concludes my presentation. Uh, myself as staff and the applicant is available to answer any questions. And I believe the applicant has a brief presentation for the city council. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fatin. I didn't realize that we had an applicant presentation, but I am more than happy to promote them. Um, if the applicant could engage that hand feature at this time. It would be just a verbal presentation. Okay, perfect. And this is Phil? Phil Heinemann. Perfect, thank you. Phil, I'm gonna go ahead and promote you now. Hey, good evening. This is Phil Hyman from Form 4 Architecture. Um, I'm also joined by James Tiefend, who is the principal in charge of this project. Um, this project was approved um, in 2018. As Fatin said, the uh, uh, building is scaled for the downtown. It fits in nicely. Um, the applicant, due to um, the hardships of, of COVID-19, um, was unable to um, continue with the project but now we have actually been hired to further the, the development of the design and we just need to complete the working drawings. Um, we are um, waiting for the client to authorize us. Um, they are securing finances and hope to um, build this uh, asset for the community as soon as we can. Uh, we're proud of this work and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from city council before we open the public hearing? 
Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you, Mayor Nash. Uh, this is a question for staff. Um, can you confirm that the BMR is associated, that, that the below market rate amount um, associated with this project is from the commercial part of it? I believe so, yes. And so because they're only building four units, um, it's not triggering the residential BMR requirement, which is um, if there's five units, then a unit is required. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I would now like to open public hearing. City Clerk Heron, could you please call for the public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item J3, consider and adopt a resolution approving a revision to a previously approved vesting tentative map to change the expiration date of the map associated with the mixed use development project located at 706 to 716 Santa Cruz Avenue. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. For anyone in person who wishes to make comment on this item, we ask that you step up to the podium now. And our first speaker will be uh, calling in. I will announce the last four of your phone number. And if you could just state your name before you make your comment, please. Okay, looks like that hand did go down. So this will be the final call for public comment on item J3. Yes, please step right up. And if you can state your name for the record. Hello, Madam Mayor. My name is Paul Kalachi. I just have a couple of questions. Um, they're simple ones. What is a vested tentative map? Is it a parcel map? Um, my second question is, because I didn't see one appearing in the staff report. My second question is, um, are vested tentative maps submitted along with the project application? And, and where in the city are they kept? Are they kept with engineering or are they kept in planning? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Final call for public comment on item J3. Seeing none, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And at this um, time, I would like to close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. Um, the first point I would like to um, bring up is what uh, the public speaker, Mr. Kalachi, um, raised. And I was wondering if we could get an answer from staff, please. Yes, uh, Ms. Uh... Mayor Nash, uh, I would defer this question to be answered by the Public Works uh, Department. I believe we have Ms. Tanisha Warner with us this evening, who may assist us uh, answering this question. Uh, tentative vesting maps are the purview of the engineering division and, and not planning, so I'll let her uh, answer this question. And Tanisha, I'm promoting you now. Good evening, Mayor Nash, City Council. I just want to confirm that you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for the question. Um, sorry, let me just turn my video on. So a vesting tentative map, it's, it's basically conferring a right to proceed with a development. We are looking at conformance with a uh, city policy, ordinances, uh, the subdivision map act, and we're also looking for uh, just the basic improvements to be shown on the vesting tentative map. 
they are valid for a period of two years. And so the reason that we're here tonight is just to extend that two year period. Thank you. And I think there was one last question and that is how does one see the vesting tentative map for this project or any project? Uh, so that for that question, I, I do need to defer back to our, our planning department. Um, so the vesting tentative map is associated with the planning commission plan set. So it would be available there should the uh, um, interested inquirer be interested to have a look at it. We just did not attach it to the city council's package because this is an extension request. Thank you so much. And are there any other questions or comments from council? Any discussion? Vice Mayor Willison. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I am entirely sympathetic to the applicants' um, challenges during COVID and whatnot, and I, I am in support of um, approving the extension. I did want to um, just note, um, as we do rezoning and um, look at how to incentivize more housing in our housing element um, next steps, um, I am a little concerned that this project um, is four units, um, each of which I think has an average square footage of about 3,600, 3,690 3, square feet. So um, I wanna um, see what levers um, we have to um, incentivize um, more units, potentially smaller units. Um, I'm not opposed to larger units, but these are, um, to me quite large and seem to be um, potentially trying to skirt the um, trigger to require an affordable housing unit. Um, and so I just wanted to, to note that that's um, from a policy level, um, how I'm thinking about this, but for the item um, on the agenda this evening, I am in support um, of the extension. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Willison. And I agree that um, as we look at BMR guidelines in the future, we should be looking at not just um, the trigger of the five units or more requirement, but also if um, perhaps a square footage requirement, um, which would um, take into account some of the larger units we sometimes see, um, the multiple larger units. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions, discussion, and I see that um, Councilmember Mueller has joined us. Welcome, thank you. All right, is there a motion and a second on the table? Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, um, I'll move to adopt the resolution approving a revision um, to, um, and Ms. Heron perhaps can read the, the, the whole thing, but I'll, I'll move it. Thank you, um, and I would I will second that. Um, City Clerk Heron, would you please state the motion and call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Willison and a second by Mayor Nash to adopt a resolution to approve a two-year extension of a vesting tentative map associated with the major subdivision not to exceed four residential condominium units and one commercial areas with rights reserved for up to 10 commercial condominium units. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Mueller? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, I am very honestly, I'm, I'm looking to city clerk Heron, whether seeing that the Sheeper organization um, is here, whether we should continue to the regular business, that regular business item, and then go to the public hearing, which I believe will take a little bit more time or whether we should um, continue with public hearings at this time. 
Do you have any suggestions? Let me just take a peek at my attendees because I know um, for J1 and J2, the folks were believing that it would start later in the evening. Um, but let me see if they're here now. Yeah, so it looks like um, our presenters for J1 um, are here, staff is here for J2. However, if you um, would like to just go to the sheeper item, you can. It, it. All right, let's um, proceed to um, regular business um, K1 with um, the sheeper item, given that the individuals are here, and I think it will be a slightly shorter discussion. And actually, um, Manash, let me apologize for the interruption and the lack of clarification. Actually, it looks like we do need to stick with the public hearing because the motion at the beginning of the meeting was to begin that item J1 and J2 when we had a full council. Thank you very yes. much. I'm so sorry about that. No, that is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so we will now um, proceed to J1 public hearing. All right, um, this public hearing is J1, receive the elections code section 9212 report regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single family detached homes. To introduce the item is Assistant Community Development Director, Deanna Chow. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Nash and members of the City Council. I'm Deanna Chow, Assistant Community Development Director. And here with me this evening are members of the consultant team that was selected to prepare the 9212 elections report. So tonight for the presentation, we will have Jeff Bradley from the M Group, Ali Zhao from Hexagon, as well as Stephanie Hagar from BAE. And I believe if we can wait just a, a couple more minutes, we'll get our consultant team um, here, to, here to present the report findings to you. I believe everyone should be promoted. Um, feel free to pop on screen and share screen at this time, Jeff. So Jeff Bradley, uh, trying to promote you now. Um. So I know Stephanie, I believe you've already been promoted. Is that correct? There we go. Stephanie, you should be able to step up. Um, I will continue to try and connect with Jeff.
So, Mayor Nash, um, may I uh, request maybe a brief recess while we try and get a hold of our consultant? That sounds like a very good idea. Um, do you want to call a specific time or you'll just? Um, why don't we go for um, eight since that'll be about Sounds 10 great. So we will uh, take a break until 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.
having our city council back in our in-person and virtual dais. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. And so um, Assistant Community Director, Development Director, Deanna Chow will introduce this item. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor Nash and members of the City Council. So um, again, I'm here to uh, introduce our consultant team who prepared the Elections Code 9212 report um, and Jeff Bradley from the M Group will be kicking off the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Mayor Nash, members of the City Council. This is Jeff Bradley with M Group. I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen now. Can you see that, Mayor Nash? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So first off, I'd just like to reiterate um, this agenda item J1 is in regards to a citizen sponsored initiative that proposes an amendment to the land use element of the general plan that would prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park uh, from doing two things. One, changing the general plan designation of properties that were designated very low density residential or low density residential as of April 15th. 2022. Those are both general plan land use categories. Number two would prohibit the city council from rezoning properties that were zoned residential estate, residential estate suburban, single family suburban residential, single family suburban residential Felton Gables, single family urban residential, or single family urban residential Lorelei Manor as of April 15th. 2022. As we go through the uh, high level overview of the 9212 report uh, that analyzes the impact of the ballot measure, assuming that it is passed, uh, that's the, the primary uh, mode of analysis. Uh, we will refer to these properties either as single family properties or sometimes we'll use a shorthand uh, R1 properties. But in every case, we're, we're tracking to this, um, this initiative language. Under the, under the citizen sponsor initiative, uh, properties with these general plan designations and these single family zoning designations as of April 15th of this year could only be redesignated or rezoned for other uses or denser, more dense residential uses by a majority vote of the people of the city at, of Menlo Park at a regular election. The, the initiative does not impact the city's authority or ability to redesignate or rezone properties that had other general plan land use designations and or zoning as of April 15, 2022. And so from there, I'll, we'll get into um, you know, a review of the a report. Um, the election code 912, excuse me, 9212 uh, authorizes this type of a report to be prepared uh, the city council authorized this report at your June 28th um, council meeting um, and has been prepared uh, for your review uh, and acceptance here tonight. And this presentation uh, tracks very closely to the report itself. So any numbers you see uh, correspond to the headings uh, within the report, uh, if anyone's trying to um, uh, follow along. So this first section, there's approximately uh, 10 sections. This first section uh, is entitled Impact on City's Ability to Comply with State Housing Law. Sorry. So starting with uh, Government Code Section 65008, prohibits jurisdictions. And again, this is a very high level summary. The full text is in the, is in the report. This government code prohibits jurisdictions from engaging in discriminatory land use and planning activities. It goes on to state, uh, no jurisdiction can pass a law or an ordinance that would deny the enjoyment of residence, land ownership, tenancy, or any other land use due to illegal discrimination. It's difficult to say at this point uh, if the ballot measure uh, crosses this threshold or not. We're not, we're not saying that uh, 
in those terms, uh, but it is uh, something that would 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 uh, be potentially uh, asserted um, to the extent the, uh, the the ballot measure is passed and has uh, uh, the effects that we'll talk about further in the report. So the short summary here is that the ballot the ballot measure would impede the city's inclusionary housing ordinance, which is devoted to uh, the provision of affordable housing uh, within otherwise uh, market rate developments and the, the potential for additional affordable housing uh, is 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 decreased uh, to a degree. The next topic under this this major topic is what is the impact on production of affordable housing and affirmatively further fair housing, uh, also known as AFFH. Uh, the, the measure would increase the difficulty to both increase the production of affordable housing in terms of raw numbers and also to make needed progress on, affordable, on affirmatively furthering fair housing, which some of the key tenants are that new housing uh, should be distributed uh, throughout a community. Affordable housing should be distributed throughout the community, but also with a special emphasis on areas that are uh, considered high resource areas. Uh, these are areas that are typically wealthier uh, have have higher household incomes, um, have that good access to parks, good access to high quality schools, uh, and other services. This, on on its face, uh, can be argued that, that it creates a disparate impact on Black, Latinx, Native American, and other multiracial households. The next section talks about the internal consistency of the city's general plan and specific plans, housing element including planning and zoning, which must be consistent. As the report details, uh, the measure would affect the internal consistency of both the general plan at, as it stands now and the 2015 uh, 2023 housing element, which is the city's existing housing element. Several policies uh, would be potentially inconsistent with the measure and would need to be either revised uh, to be more consistent with the measure or, or removed. Impacts on other existing housing sites in the draft housing element. Uh, the, the most immediate impact that we've identified uh, is that the former flood school site, uh, site number 38, uh, identified in the, in the draft housing element uh, that was just submitted to HCD on Friday uh, would, would be most impacted um, due to the a barrier of a, a ballot measure required for any rezoning of that property uh, which it would be needed for it to be a viable housing opportunity site would result in its removal from the housing element um, because that is a would be a significant barrier uh, to to development. Other sites within the housing element could be impacted if the units lost uh, or reduced from the former flood school site uh, were was decided by the by the city council or suggested by HCD to be made up or relocated. Uh, to other sites within the community. Next, we talk on the about the impact on the availability and location of housing and the ability of the city to meet ARENA, which is the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, which is a, a long way of saying the, the state uh, requirement for housing for the, for the city. The high-level overview is that over 1,500 acres 1,540 acres of low and very low density lands would be removed from consideration for higher density housing uh, within, a, within, a, within the planning context of the housing element. Of course, individual property owners or developers uh, could, could take the initiative to uh, file a ballot measure, uh, under, assuming the ballot measure passes again, um, they would have the right uh, to attempt to place a, a measure on the ballot and attempt uh, for that ballot measure to be passed successfully but as a it is seen as a seen as a very high bar uh, from the other communities that we've looked at uh, that, that have that have this type of structure this area we're talking about is is large it's made up of approximately 6500 separate distinct uh, parcels that's 6500 covers almost 44 percent of the total uh, developable land area 
of, of the city, not including the, the bay lands. Of these lands, there's a subset of parcels we've identified uh, that are not actually being used for single family uh, development, meaning they don't have a single family house on them. They're either vacant um, or a religious facility, such as a church or a temple or other underutilized uh, residential uh, units, uh, not including, um, uh, for example, a single family house with an ADU. That's not in, that's not in this category. But there are 53, 53 parcels uh, that together in aggregate uh, comprise about 116 acres uh, that, that would be precluded from rezoning. In terms of the effect on the draft housing element for the next planning period starting in 2023 and extending to 2031, uh, this, is the, this is the draft housing element that the city and its consultants have been working on since, since May of last year. And like I mentioned just previously, uh, has been sent to HCD uh, just last week for a 90-day uh, review period. Uh, our, our finding is that if the ballot measure passes, we would have to, as mentioned, would have need to remove the former flood school site uh, because the high bar that would be placed in front of that project. Overall, however, we do think that the opportunity sites would most likely still be adequate uh, to gain uh, state approval based on the numbers we have. Possible effects on future housing element planning efforts, however, would be made increasingly more difficult and would incrementally reduce the ability of the city to, to meet future state housing requirements. Section number four is impacts on public, vacant land and other sites owned by nonprofit institutions. The overview here is that these would affect these other properties that we talked about that do not currently have single family homes located on them, but have a variety of other uses. We see this as an important um, subset of properties to talk about, because these are the type of properties that would typically be considered uh, for as ho housing opportunity sites within a housing element uh, planning process like the city is currently going through. They're in some cases vacant, in some cases underutilized, uh, churches uh, under state law have some allowances for housing that are encouraged and create a path uh, for that. Uh, but the wholesale development of, of a site typically requires uh, a rezoning uh, that the ballot measure would, would make uh, fairly difficult. The average parcel size of these, this subset of properties that we've identified that have the, have the official single family zoning or the official general plan a single family a category, but are not actually used uh, in, the, in that way. The average partial size is 2.2 acres. Uh, that is, there is a typo in the report in table four uh, that, that identifies the average partial size as, as 4.2. So we just like to correct that uh, for the record um, and alert the, the city council and, and the public to that correction. In terms of the impact of the measure on vacant parcels of land, uh, there are seven parcels uh, that are vacant in this, this subset of the parcels we've identified, consisting of 3.7 acres in total with an average size of about a uh, half acre, which is the minimum size of a parcel under state gui guidelines for what's acceptable to be considered as a, as a housing opportunity site, just coincidentally. Continuing on uh, this sec topic number four, impacts on public, vacant, and other sites, uh, religious and other institutional facilities include the Menlo Park Fire Station. So that's a, that's a two acre site uh, with a longstanding fire station building use, uh, utilizing that property. Uh, however, in the past, the fire station has talked to the city about a, a major remodel or a rebuild of that fire station and the city previous to all of this discussion around the ballot measure like years ago um, was the fire district was told in order to do that they would need to apply for and gain approval of a rezone from R1 single family uh, to PF or public public facilities where fire stations are um, 
by allowed use. There's 14 religious facilities consisting of just under 35 acres. The uh, average size of those is about two and a half acres. And again, the um, existing housing element draft uh, calls out a couple of religious facilities for possible housing. Those are not impact, those are not affected by the measure uh, because the, the mechanism that's being relied, relied on there to achieve the housing is not a rezone, uh, but activation on a voluntary basis. If, if the religious facility, religious institutions decide to go forward with that under their own volition, they can decide um, to utilize some of those pathways uh, to create housing on those sites. But in the future, thinking about future housing elements, two or three cycles uh, down the road, these are the type of sites that the city um, would typically start to take, take a closer look at. There's one educational facility called St. Patrick's Seminary at 41 acres. Obviously, that's that's the largest property uh, on on the list, um, and that is uh, not in not in the not in the current draft housing element, uh, but a property of that size would at some point uh, be considered for additional housing, and the, the ballot measure would make that process uh, extremely difficult. Impact on open space, existing business districts, and developed areas designated for revitalization. This is topic number five within the report. Uh, the city has no agricultural lands. So the ballot measure would not uh, have any impact on that land use. Uh, it could increase pressure to use open space lands for housing uh, to be future state housing requirements at some point in the future. If adequate non-open space properties are not found at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over, over to Stephanie uh, from Bay Area Economics. She's going to cover items uh, 6 through 10. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hager, BAE Urban Economics. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the um, projected fiscal impacts of the ballot measure. Um, so the ballot measure would likely um, sort of starting out with the impacts associated with the flood school site in particular. Um, the ballot measure would likely prevent the development of multifamily housing on that site, which um, would likely have both direct and in indirect fiscal impacts on the city of Menlo Park. In terms of direct impacts, um, housing tends to have a negative fiscal impact on the city. There have been some recent um, fiscal impact analyses that have been conducted for other multifamily projects in Menlo Park that have had a negative fiscal impact. We would expect a similar result from other multifamily projects. Um, however, there may also be indirect uh, positive fiscal impacts associated with the development at the site. Um, partly because the site would provide workforce housing, which can help to um, attract um, in businesses and employers to the area, which may have a positive fiscal impact. Um, in addition, um, it's the, the potential housing development on the site would help um, with employee attraction and retention for the Ravenswood City School District, um, which we'll talk about more in a, in a section or two. Um, and that could have indirect fiscal impacts in the form of improving school quality um, and increasing property values, which over time as properties turned over could increase property tax revenue to the city of Menlo Park. Um, the, so the, the effects of the ballot measure um, could potentially be to prevent that housing development from going forward. In that case, it would likely prevent the fiscal impacts associated with that housing development. Um, so whether that's a positive or a negative impact sort of depends on whether those sort of direct negative impacts are offset entirely by the indirect uh, positive fiscal impacts, which is difficult to say at this point. Um, and then, Jeff, if you go to the next slide. So in terms of more medium to long term fiscal impacts of the ballot measure on all affected sites, sort of zooming out from just looking at the flood school site in particular, um, again, it's it's a little bit difficult to say what those fiscal impacts could potentially look like. Um, while the ballot measure may not have a significant impact on um, the quantity of residential development in Menlo Park going forward because the city will need to continue to meet its RENA requirements, it could have a negative impact on the quantity of non-residential development. 
Um, Non-residential development in terms of fiscal impacts can um, be both positive or negative depending on the specifics of the project. So without knowing which types of projects would be um, either prevented by, by the ballot measure or not, um, it's, it's difficult to say exactly how those fiscal impacts could play out, but those are projects that could potentially offset uh, fiscal impacts, negative fiscal impacts from residential development. Um, so next I'm going to talk about uh, impacts on infrastructure funding and costs. Um, overall, the ballot measure, um, you can go to the next slide, Jeff. Um, the ballot measure would uh, likely have a, a minimal impact on uh, infrastructure funding and costs in terms of transportation, parks and open space, and stormwater. Um, these are all, uh, you know, assuming that, that the city will still generally get the same level of residential development um, without, with, regardless of whether the ballot measure is passed. Um, these are all systems that will get sort of a similar amount of use um, and similar impact fees regardless of where they would be built in the city. Um, it should be noted that the ballot measure, as I mentioned, could have an impact also on non-residential development, um, which could reduce the amount of sort of cumulative total non-residential and, and residential development in the city over the long term. Um, which would lessen the both the impact on um, certain types of infrastructure to the extent that that were to occur, as well as um, impact fees and other funding sources associated with new development to meet those needs. Um, in terms of public school facility infrastructure, um, so the ballot measure um, would sort of one of again sort of looking starting off with the flood school site in particular and thinking about some of those near-term potential impacts associated with that site. Um, I guess first I should mention public school students in Menlo Park who are elementary or middle school age attend one of four school districts. Uh, this is Menlo Park City, Las Lomitas, Ravenswood City, and Redwood City School District. Um, with the three that sort of cover the most area being Menlo Park City, Las Lomitas, and Ravenswood. Um, so the the flood school site, former flood school site, is located in the Ravenswood City School District. And so um, preventing, if the, to the extent that the ballot measure prevents the development of housing on that site, it would also potentially lessen the amount of students in the Ravenswood City School District that would be associated with that development. Um, of the school districts in Menlo Park that, uh, that, that serve elementary and middle school students, Menlo Park City is the school district that has noted that they are experiencing potential capacity constraints, meaning that if they, um, there are certain levels of growth at which they have concerns about whether they can accommodate new students. Ravenswood City School District has not noted similar concerns. So um, whether or not the development occurs at the flood school site in particular would likely not have much of an impact on that district um, from a facilities perspective because uh, they can accommodate that growth either way, but they would um, not, but they also would not get impact fees from the development that they would otherwise get if there were a housing development built on that site. Um, the other elementary and middle school districts in Menlo Park um, could potentially be impacted by the ballot measure to the extent that it means that over time, um, some of those units are shifted to other school districts. Um, and you know, in particular, if, if some of those units get shifted to the Menlo Park City School District, that's the district that's experiencing facility impacts uh, that could potentially uh, be affected by that. The high school district, uh, Sequoia Union High School District serves all of Menlo Park. Um, so they're unlikely to have significant impacts um, on their facilities, although they have noted that they have facility constraints that would occur regardless of where in Menlo Park new housing is built. Um, so next I'm going to talk about the uh, community's ability to attract and retain business and employment. Um, there are sort of two main buckets of this impact. Um, and uh, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. Um, so the first is thinking about potential workforce housing impacts. Um, so to the extent that the ballot measure could potentially reduce the amount of workforce housing that's built in Menlo Park, that could have a negative impact on um, business attraction and, and retention. We know that workforce housing is a major issue in terms of workforce housing, in terms of uh, business and um, employment attraction and retention. 
Um, the ballot measure also, in addition to um, affecting potential workforce housing, could also impact the availability of sites for non-residential development. So um, as Jeff noted, there are some sites that are located, uh, that are currently zoned R1 or single family, that are not currently used for, uh, are not currently developed with single family uses. And these are sites that could potentially over time be um, potential candidate sites for non-residential development. So to the extent that the ballot measure would uh, prevent some of those uh, properties from changing over, that could limit the amount of uh, business and employment that could be a, a, attracted to Menlo Park. Um, okay, and so next I'm going to talk about the impact on racial and economic equity. Um, under California state law, state and local agencies are required to ensure that their laws, programs, and activities affirmatively further fair housing, and that they don't take, oh, sorry, Jeff, uh, next slide, please. And that they don't take any um, actions that are inconsistent with that obligation. Um, so that means both addressing overt discrimination in housing, but it also means overcoming historic patterns of segregation and ensuring that all segments of the community and the population have uh, access to opportunity. Um, so th this also means fostering inclusive communities and achieving racial equity, fair housing choice, and opportunity for all residents. Part of this involves examining planning and zoning policies, as these have historically served to enforce resident residential segregation, um, in particular through single family zoning that um, has been designed in, in historically to exclude lower income residents and people of color from specific neighborhoods. Um, so I'm gonna talk about cost burdened households for a moment. Um, a household is generally considered cost burdened if it spends more than 30% of its income on housing costs. Um, that's sort of the threshold at which particularly lower income households are seen to uh, potentially be struggling to afford housing, uh, potentially be at risk of displacement. In Menlo Park, cost burden households are disproportionately Black and Latino households uh, to a greater extent than other racial and ethnic groups in Menlo Park. So this means that there's disproportionate housing needs, disproportionate risk of displacement, um, and a greater need for affordable housing in, in areas that provide access to opportunity among these groups. Uh, next slide. Um, so there is additional state of California oversight related to um, affirmatively furthering fair housing. The state uh, Department of Housing and Community Development has um, initiated a housing accountability division that is charged with holding jurisdictions accountable for meeting their housing element commitments and complying with, a, with a state housing law. Um, there is a potential that the ballot measure could invite state level scrutiny related to affirmatively furthering fair housing and complying with state law um, related to issues that the housing accountability division um, is trying to hold uh, cities and, and counties accountable for. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I just hang on there. Sorry, the slides won't match what I'm saying, but, but give me a moment. Um, so in terms of the impact of the former flood school site on affirmatively furthering fair housing, and then we'll zoom out again, looking more citywide. Um, the former flood school site is, is in an area that's designated a high resource area, which means that it has characteristics that are shown to support positive educational, economic, and health outcomes for low-income families. Um, the site is also located in one of the highest income census block groups in the city and in an area of Menlo Park that is predominantly white. Um, developing, this means that developing housing on the former flood school site would help to improve access to opportunity and overcome existing patterns of economic and racial segregation. Uh, to the extent that the ballot measure prevents development of the of housing at the former flood school site, um, this could work against the city's ability to um, help to improve racial equity and affirmatively further fair housing. And then sort of zooming out and looking more broadly at all of the sites that could potentially be impacted by the ballot measure. Um, Jeff mentioned that we looked at some sites that are, that all the sites that are zoned R1 or single family that are currently not being used um, as single family parcels. So those are the 53 parcels with 116 acres that Jeff mentioned. 
Um, and these are sort of the sites that we see as having the most potential in the future for um, multifamily use uh, just over the, over the long term because they're not currently being used for single family uses. Um, looking at these 53 sites, it's, we found that these uh, site, the, that the ballot measure would primarily impact the potential for multifamily housing in areas that are high resource areas, high income areas, and areas where the population is predominantly white. This means that to the extent that the ballot measure discourages um, or prevents the development of affordable housing in or near these single family neighborhoods, um, it's help, it, it can function to help to enforce existing patterns of uh, racial and economic segregation. Um, okay, now I'm ready. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> So uh, next I'm going to talk about educational equity, in particular the impact on the Ravenswood City School District. Um, so as I mentioned, there are four school districts that serve elementary and middle school aged students in Menlo Park. Um, compared to the Menlo Park City and Las Lomitas School District, the Ravenswood City School District um, has lower test scores, a higher percentage of students receiving free or reduced lunch, um, lower teacher salaries and a higher percentage of first and second year teachers, um, and then also much less budget per student. Um, after you adjust for the need among the student population, the Ravenswood City School District recently uh, prepared a presentation that noted that that the Ravenswood City School District has the lowest per pupil per pupil funding um, in all of San Mateo County. Um, the district, as part of their strategic plan and their um, future, their, their strategic plan related to their budget going forward, um, has identified the former flood school site as a potential site for teacher and staff housing. Uh, the goals of this are sort of twofold. One is to um, lease the site to a developer that would uh, then pay a ground lease to the district, generating revenue to the district. Um, the, the district would then, then has the intention of using that um, to go entirely towards closing the salary gap for their teachers and other staff um, in order to make the Ravenswood School District more competitive with other districts and help with employee retention. Um, in addition, the housing would be designated for district teachers and staff, which is also meant to help with employee um, attraction and retention. Um, and this is really meant to sort of help close that uh, funding gap between the Ravenswood City School District and the other school districts that serve Menlo Park. Um, so to the extent that the ballot measure prevents the development of the flood school site, um, that, that's a, that would um, significantly impact the Ravenswood City School District strategic plan related to their budgeting um, and their efforts to achieve uh, greater equity between the school districts. Oh, and next I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Ali uh, to talk about impact on climate and traffic congestion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stephanie. Uh, good evening, Mayor Nash, members of the City Council. I'm Ali Joe, Principal Associate with Hexagon. Um, our analysis of the ballot measure's effect on transportation mainly consisted of a qualitative VMT analysis. VMT stands for Vehicle Miles Traveled, uh, which is the CEQA transportation metric uh, and level of service analysis. Uh, I'll refer to it as LOS in this uh, following. Um, this is a non CEQA operational metric maintained by the city. Uh, so first, we took a closer look at the former uh, flood school site, uh, as all the other topics have. So this parcel is in a relatively high VMT area. Um, so if you know the ballot measure passes and the units cannot be devolved on the site, uh, or if the city council chooses to redistribute uh, these units, I believe it's 90 units, to other locations or other opportunity areas, um, presumably it's a lower VMT area, then the overall housing element update VMT effect would reduce ever so slightly. Uh, it's most likely that it's not going to be noticeable given uh, we're only talking nine, about 90 units. And um, you know, since it's only 90 units, uh, whether they're developed uh, on the on the site, they're not developed or they're developed elsewhere. Um, you know, uh, talking about peak hour uh, traffic 
generation, it has a very minimal um, amount generated. Therefore, it will have a very minimal effect on intersection operations and level of service as well. Uh, next, we, we zoomed out a little bit and took a look at all, of, all the parcels that are R1 zoned, uh, but, are, but do not have single family uses on the site currently. Uh, these are also sites that are not in the draft housing element plan as of now. Um, so, um, but these sites, you know, as Jeff mentioned previously, they may be needed for future renal requirements. So uh, we analyzed what, uh, what would the ballot manager's transportation effect be on these parcels if scenario one, the city can meet future renal requirements with all these sites, and scenario two, if the city cannot meet future renal requirements with all these sites. Um, so the first scenario, if the city can meet future renal requirements with all these sites, uh, we took a broad look at whether uh, where housing can be accommodated in the city without using these uh, sites. So if units are spread across um, uh, areas like, you know, um, downtown El Camino Real area, uh, Sharon, Park, uh, Sharon Heights and North in the northern part of the city where there are, you know, still some capacity left, um, the VMT effect is likely minimal um, because we're talking a mixture between uh, lower BMT areas and, and, you know, slightly higher BMT areas, so they tend to average out. Uh, from a level of service perspective, um, you know, without, without developing on, on these sites that we're talking about, these 52 sites, so that means that more concentrated growth will happen in one area or another, and that could potentially lead to further traffic congestion, but, um, you know, it is too early for us to be able to postulate um, because you know we have to take a look at exactly how many units are redistributed to a particular area. Uh, next, uh, if the city cannot meet future renal requirements without these sites. Um, so that means the units that cannot be accommodated in the city, what will happen is that they will still likely happen, uh, they will still be likely be developed elsewhere, uh, just you know, given the strong housing demands in the Bay Area, just now, outside of the city, um, what that would do is that that would worsen the city's job housing balance, meaning more people will be commuting into the city for jobs, less opportunity, and these people have less opportunity to take advantage of the city's transit, bike, and pedestrian facilities. Uh, from a VMT perspective, the regional VMT would worsen um, from a level of service, pers um, and that the regional VMT would worsen because. Um, you know, commuting into the city tends to be longer trips than if people are commuting within the city. From a level of service perspective, um, the city has a significant level of employment and it will continue to attract commuting into the city for jobs. Um, so if now uh, more people are commuting into the city compared to uh, if people can commute within the city, you know, these trips will still end up showing up on city streets. So uh, we believe the level of service effect but, but regarding the ballot measure is minimal. Uh, so Jeff, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, overall from a VMT perspective in the near term, um, so we're talking, you know, the most, uh, the next renal cycle, the sixth cycle, there will be minimal and likely unnoticeable changes uh, from a VMT perspective. Uh, from a traffic congestion perspective, looking at level of service in the near term or far term, we believe there will be uh, very minimal effects um, as well. Uh, but in the far term, as I just alluded to, if the ballot measure resulting in the city uh, able to meet its future re renal requirements, uh, then there uh, could be a negative effect on regional VMT due to now, uh, the, you know, we're talking longer trip length for people commuting into the city. And I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thank you, Ali. On my camera here. So that, that concludes our, our report out on the summary of the 9212 election report on the uh, ballot measure. I would like to read just a brief uh, summary of, 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 of our findings. Uh, the report finds that while the ballot measure would limit new multifamily development in single family areas, it would have a limited impact on the overall number of housing units that can be built in the near future because the city can rezone other areas to enable new housing development 
as necessary to meet regional housing needs allocation requirements under state law. Over time, however, the city would have less flexibility in planning for future housing because the ballot measure would limit the ability to plan for housing on certain sites. Additionally, under the measure, the future distribution of new housing may be inconsistent with fair housing requirements contained within the affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing law adopted by the state of California in, in 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from city council before we open the public hearing? I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item J1, receive the election code section 9212 report regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single family detached homes. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. And for anyone in person, who wishes to provide comment, you may step up, step up to the podium now. And just for members of the public who have their hand raised, I do wanna remind you that this item is related to receiving the elections code section report. It does not have to pertain to the action item, which is J2. So if you are interested in commenting on both, that's fine. Or if you just had a comment on J2, um, we can call for public comment at that time. And so our first speaker will be Rini Sen Gupta, followed by Steve Wong. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I uh, live in suburban park, and uh, my view is that high density housing is typically near restaurants, shops public transit and has appropriate infrastructure. If it is instead being planned in the middle of a neighborhood, which does not have the infrastructure or even wide streets, then it is compromising the safety of the neighborhood by increasing traffic. In such situations, I strongly believe that residents should have the right to vote on it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Steve Wong, followed by a caller with the phone number ending 6650. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, thank you. I was a resident of Suburban Park since I was a baby. I moved back into the neighborhood after college in 2000 to raise my three kids near their grandparents. I've been the neighborhood association president, was an active board member for many years, and with my parents continue to run the neighborhood 4th of July bike parade. When I heard the plans to build 60, 90, 200 houses on the side of my little old elementary school down the street, of course I was concerned. Hearing how the decisions were being made, I was even more concerned. We gathered locally and neighbors put their heads together. The possibility of the initiative was formed. I helped canvas for signatures and had honest open dialogue with all who signed my petition sheets. I've seen people drive through <coughs> the neighborhood tearing down signs supporting our cause. Multiple times I've been called the NIMBY for searching for alternative solutions to the worst case we are facing. While collecting signatures in the Bellhaven area, I was called a rich white racist, all for trying to maintain my own quality of life that I have had for close to 60 years. I assure you that I'm not rich, not white, nor am I racist. I went to the public schools in the Raywood City School District from James Flood Elementary to Menlo Wells High, for what it's worth. Besides the issues of access, quality of life, and location, there must be better solutions in the flood site. There must be. There are 11,000 square acres of Menlo Park. 
I support our initiative, not just for my backyard, but for the backyards of all my Menlo Park neighbors who also have the right to maintain the expected quality of life in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is calling in from 6650, followed by Alex Torres. And for our caller, I'll ask that you state your name for the record. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I just wanted to thank the council for having me. Um, my name is Sarah Chaffin, and I'm the founder of an advocacy group called supportteacherhousing.org. And I'd just like to speak a little bit um, about the difficulty of uh, this ballot measure and the need to recruit and retain teachers specifically for the Ravenswood City School District. Um, the teachers there average about $75,000 a year and the cost of a house in that area is about $1.7 million. So um, this ballot measure would make it extremely difficult um, to build housing on that site. So I would just like the council to really, um, you know, to really think about the need of the teachers um, and the school employees and how the flood school site, you know, with having 90 units could really help the students, the families, um, and the teachers in that area. And I strongly urge the council not to support this ballot measure. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Alex Torres, followed by Jackie Aguianyar. Good evening, members of the council. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Alex Torres here, Director of State Government Relations for the Bay Area Council. And on behalf of our 300 members, I, I wanna express our concern with this ballot measure. I understand the, the next item is uh, urging action. I apologize, I have to drop off, so I'll try and refine my comments focused on uh, this excellent report uh, prepared by uh, the consultants. Uh, the Bay Area Council is an employer-sponsored public policy and advocacy organization dedicated to solving our region's most challenging issues and improving the quality of life for everyone who calls this region home. Uh, at a time when businesses are evaluating long-term whether to stay in our region and, and in our state, uh, this measure, measure's passage would be extremely detrimental. Uh, HCD estimates the state must plan for 2.5 million new units, an estimated 312,000 units annually and over uh, 200,000 more units than we're currently permitting. The short, short, shortage of housing continues to disproportionately impact low-income communities and communities of color that are being priced out of Bay Area communities by the lack of housing options. But we can combat this. Every county and city must do its part to produce more housing at all levels of affordability, including and especially the city, which uh, I, I strongly urge that you all can do by opposing this measure. The report did an excellent job of talking about some of the, uh, uh, the impacts of this decision. Um, earlier today in the agenda, you heard a great report on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what the city can do from its advisory committee. Um, building more housing results in fewer folks having to take longer trips uh, to get to work, to get to where they live, to get home. Re uh, re that results in, in less vehicle miles traveled that is an impact that will re reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the environmental benefits, the equity benefits, the economic benefits are clear. We need housing in communities throughout the state uh, and in our region, especially housing for critical workforce uh, like teachers and school staff. So um, I, I, of course, I wanna reiterate the, the uh, thanks for an excellent and exhaustive uh, report prepared by, by the consultants that really hit home on the fact that this is an environmental benefit long-term to build housing. Um, there is an economic benefit and of course an equity benefit in that we are undoing some of the harm that single family zoning, uh, single home zoning has uh, caused in, in basically segregating uh, our communities historically. So again, thanks for the great report prepared. We strongly urge action to oppose this measure at the appropriate time. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. 
So our next speaker will be Jaggi Ayangar, followed by Rob Solano. Okay, Jaggi, and... did you want to provide public comment on this item? Yes. Okay, go right ahead. So, <clears throat> so good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members and neighbors. Uh, my name is Jaggi Ayangar. My wife, Leonore, and I migrated from different parts of the world, met in grad school, and chose Menlo Park as our home some 40 years back, and I raised two boys. I run a tech company with employees around the world, living in their charming towns and some in beautiful villages, all digitally connected. I would urge the council members to think a bit more strategically and not make hasty growth decisions based on the societal needs of today. So remote work is the new paradigm that is here to stay. And it is widely believed that there will be a steady exodus of people to small and more livable villages and towns away from the Bay Area. Moreover, the dream of local jobs that is driving the short-term view of for denser housing is a chimera, in my opinion. On this 95th anniversary of the city, I believe Menlo Park can retain its charm and value for another 100 years by enacting sensible growth policies. Firstly, citizens of Menlo Park should definitely have a say when it comes to lifestyle and zoning, and I urge you to put this initiative on the ballot in November. Secondly, I would go a step further and say that by voting today to adopt this initiative, which in my opinion is detailed, lawful and reasonable into law, you will be demonstrating your long-term vision and leadership for this charming town, which is almost certainly a rarity in today's America. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Rob Solano, followed by Kathleen Daly. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Madam Mayor, Honorable Council Members. My name is Rob Solano and I reside at 140 Hedge Road, Menlo Park. On the record, I am speaking tonight as a resident of Menlo Park, not as an elected official of the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. I'm in favor of putting this issue on the ballot and let the people decide. I have identified four, me, four of my concerns as a resident for over 34 years. Traffic, a huge problem. Anyone that's been on Marsh Road or Willow Roads, morning or afternoon, afternoon commute times, has seen backed up traffic in our neighborhoods and surrounding communities. How will that affect our emergency vehicle response that includes police, fire, and other emergency related services involving public safety? It's gonna slow it down. The effect of bicycle and pedestrian safety, this includes both adult and children. During 2021, there were 1,275 bicycle related collisions in San Mateo County, resulting in 1,185 cyclist injuries and nine cyclist fatalities. Recently, this month, June 29th, a pedestrian was struck by a San Mateo bus on El Camino Real. And how about parking? Have you been downtown during lunchtime and trying to find a parking place? And what about the, mes the many residential areas that includes the size of local streets and thoroughfares that if vehicles park on either side of the street, large vehicles, maybe a fire truck, garbage truck, construction truck can pass. Please consider my concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Kathleen Daly, followed by Nicole Kimney. Sorry about that, Kathleen. Trying no, to worry. no worries. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mayor Nash and uh, members of the City Council to give me an opportunity to speak. There's two things that come to mind tonight. I think the first one 
that really um, resonates with me is the number of young people that spoke earlier about the environmental issues. These are young people in their 20s and 30s who know what world we older people are leaving for them. And I think if you have an opportunity to have a conversation with a young person in their late teens, early 20s and 30s, um, employees that work for me, and you explain to them this issue about the flood park housing and what this uh, balance issue is all about, they look at you like, what, are you crazy? We wouldn't find a place for teachers to live. This doesn't make any sense, Kathleen. I hear this over and over again from a number of young people that I speak with. I think the other thing that I wanna talk about or go back to is the comments that were made by the wonderful teachers of the Ravenswood district, teachers and staff. Housing is a major, major financial burden for staff. A lot of us are on low income housing waiting lists for years. So the district having its own would be beneficial to a lot of employees. It would change my life. Say that again, it would change my life. A super important um, point for teachers, staff, the people that feed our children, who um, take care of the facilities. These are people that are committed to the education of our young people going forward. I would be able to afford staying at my current job. I could save money for emergencies. I could save for retirement. Teachers would be more active members of the community. Despite my love for working in this community, housing affordability has me worried about my longevity in this district. These were comments made by teachers and staff when asked about their interest in this housing. We need to live closer to our jobs. It would make me feel better and not have to constantly be worried about housing. The, the people that might be affected by this are not the people that struggle day in, day out with housing challenges. This, we are talking about teachers, we are talking about staff, we are talking about the future of this country and making sure that the teachers feel uh, welcome, appreciated, and have great housing just like every other person here in Menlo Park, in East Palo Alto, in Belhaven, in Redwood City. This is such an important point that we should all care about. It would change someone's life. That should be more important than anything else. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Nicole Kimney, followed by Karen Grove. Hello, everybody. Thank you for letting me speak. I love the previous comments. Um, I have three points, but really one main one, which is that listening to this um, well-prepared report by the consultants, you can see that this decision, um, whether to have a ballot measure, what to do about our zoning, affects so many important topics. It affects local traffic, it affects climate, it affects equity, it affects quality of schools, it affects the character of the city. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but my point in bringing up all of these things is that I cannot imagine that any city council would want to cede their ability to make decisions on all of these crucial points um, about about our town's life to to seed their ability to make uh, legislative decisions about the town that they are charged with making decisions about. I mean, it, zoning is a core function of of the you know city legislators. I mean, if they're not seeing to zoning decisions which touch everything else what on earth are they doing i mean i cannot believe any city council would surrender their ability to make those decisions those crucial decisions about life in their city um i should tell you that i have a degree in urban planning so the idea of giving up the zoning function and putting that on a ballot and having the general public make decisions is really bizarre. 
the general public cannot possibly delve into all the issues and educate themselves um, in the same way that the, the city council can do. Um, and then in my last minute, I'll just say that I think um, all of us, our society, our town, our high school, everybody would benefit from having um, the ability to retain and and get excellent teachers in the Ravenswood district. Um, I have two children at Menlo Atherton. I'm sure that uh, they would be pleased if all of the incoming students had equally wonderful educations. Um, and I really don't understand the objections to, to housing teachers and school staff in the neighborhood. I really don't know who would lose anything by doing that or what the sacrifice would be. And uh, I'll cede my 12 seconds. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Karen Grove, followed by Evelyn Stivers. Good evening, um, Karen Grove, resident of Menlo Park. Um, I started attending city council meetings after the 2016 election, and I did that to participate in the sanctuary city efforts. And at that time, it was I was very proud. We declared ourselves to be an inclusive, welcoming, safe city for people from all walks of life, regardless of race, ethnicity, or country of origin, or, or religious beliefs. In 2019 and 2020, Menlo Together held a bunch of workshops, the same workshop eight or nine times, to explore and reflect on the way our government policies segregated America and how Menlo Park policies segregated Menlo Park. It was powerful to grapple with this aspect of our city's history and legacy. And we did that in community, we did it with others. It was really moving. In 2020, we marched for Black Lives. So I really wanna thank the city council for including racial and educational equity impacts in the study of the ballot measure because the report validates in governmentees what we have been hearing people say in human words for years and years and years based on lived experience. Page J139 of the document talks about the disparate impacts of the 2016 Connect Menlo General Plan update. It takes a whole page um, and it concludes, to the extent that the ballot measure discourages delays or prevents affordable housing to be provided in or near existing single family areas throughout the entire city, it will function as a continuation of this historic use of strict land use controls to perpetuate unequal and unfair governmental aims by enforcing and locking in residential, racial and economic segregation. So in every color of law workshop that Menlo Together facilitated, people expressed a deep desire to right the wrongs of the past and to shape a more equitable and inclusive future. This ballot measure is another chapter in that story. And I know this belongs in the next section, but I just wanna say, I urge you to oppose the measure tonight and to do everything you can to ensure that it doesn't pass. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Evelyn Stivers, followed by Buck Bard. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Evelyn Stivers, Executive Director of Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. We work with communities and their leaders to create and preserve quality affordable homes. I really appreciate this council's leadership in generating this report. It is very clear from the findings that this ballot measure is taking a very complicated and intricate problem and using a blunt instrument to solve only one part of that problem. This measure attempts brain surgery with a baseball bat. I appreciate all of the work the council has done to work with community members on all of the development issues facing the city, but especially trying to prevent this from moving forward. I know you are all passionate about your positions and take your roles very seriously. So given the legal, 
financial and equity impacts this measure would have on the city based on the findings of this report and the great need for Ravenswood school employees. I urge the council to show strong, unambiguous leadership and oppose the measure. Spend time, spend money, spread the word about the potential harm that this measure would cause your city. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Buck Bard, followed by Nicole Chisari. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you. I wanna thank the city council for allowing me to speak tonight on this important topic. I wanna to go back to what Jeff Bradley said. He kept using the phrases high bar and difficult and it occurred to me, shouldn't that be the case? Shouldn't we be very deliberative and focusing on, on maintaining the culture that everybody who has bought into home ownership in Menlo Park and the reasons why they did that? I, I think that should be a collective decision, but now it's not, unfortunately. And that's really the focus of this ballot initiative is to give power back to the voters, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But I wanna know why this report is so focused, this unbiased report as it was commissioned, is so focused on flood school. Everything, everything starts out with the flood school site and talks about that. And then, and then as the presenters pointed out, zoomed out. And, and it just seemed to be a very biased report. It seemed to be a directed at, at, at uh, alleviating objections to that development project and and not focusing on Menlo Park as a whole. And you know, there's there were there's talk about you know one of the commenters said you know the city council should not surrender you know the power of zoning. Well, they're not surrendering anything. This is this is this is Menlo Park. This is you know you're supposed to be representing us. You're supposed to be representing the voters and homeowners of Menlo Park. You're not surrendering anything. You're supposed to be representing us. And finally, um, I want to focus on, I want to talk about this little fa false focus on teachers. How many units in this development are reserved for teachers? Zero. There's nothing reserved for teachers. There's nothing stopping the Raven Ravenswood School District from building units and selling them to the teachers at below market value, but they're not. They're simply providing another rental structure. They're not building the wealth of the teachers they're not helping them build long-term wealth. They're not solving any generational inequities. They're just creating a, an alternate rental structure. So, you know, I just want to point out in, in, in sort of closing here, you know, how all the voices in opposition to this proposal are all from people outside of Menlo Park. They talk about the future distribution, distribution of new housing. And Alex Torres, uh, direct quote, the harm of single family housing. I think the voters of Menlo Park understand what this is about, and I think they'll vote the correct way in the fall. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Nicole Chasari, followed by a phone number ending in 8448. Hi, thank you. Um, as one of the proponents of the measure, we're looking forward to seeing this initiative on the ballot in November. Uh, I want to note that while petitioning, we've received overwhelming support from Menlo Park residents citywide. Um, that's self-evident by the fact that we gathered 3,000 signatures in less than three weeks. Um, this initiative gives people a say regarding the type of development that will occur where they live. Our initiative has no impact on rezoning of commercial parcels, industrial parcels, or even existing residential parcels that are zoned for something other than low-density single-family homes. The city study, which is almost entirely theoretical about what could potentially happen or not happen if the initiative is passed, does at least have one concrete fact. It shows there are 1,977 usable acres of a total 3517 acres that are not affected by the initiative. 
that is plenty of land to rezone to higher density to build offices, high density housing, or commercial properties. And even the second consultant tonight said that this initiative will not impact development of housing because the number of units required by the state remains unchanged. There is no need to convert existing residential parcels to high density when there are plenty of other more desirable options available. This initiative also doesn't block any development on low density single family parcels. It forces developers to work with the public if they want to build something that could introduce a ton of traffic into their quiet neighborhoods. This is something they should be doing anyways, but they aren't doing it enough, if at all. The city's study focuses on the potential future desire to rezone 53 low density single family parcels that don't have a single family home on them without ruling out the possibility of rezoning low density single family home parcels with single family homes on them. It also completely ignores that these 53 parcels are surrounded by single family homes and fails to address or acknowledge the potentially negative impacts from traffic to those neighborhoods. And this highlights the problem. City councils focused on development without focusing enough, if at all, on the impact of Menlo Park residents uh, living in the houses near that development. Menlo Park's current system is broken, where three city council members who don't represent a certain district can currently vote to rezone a low-density single-family parcel against the wishes of the city council member for that district and against the wishes of the public. They have no accountability to Menlo Park citizens out of their district when making such decisions that may significantly impact them. This isn't right, and this initiative is one step towards helping fix that broken system. People's homes are sacrosanct. People choose to live where they want to live, and they should have a vote. And I'm glad that they will have a vote on this initiative. And if it passes, they'll have a vote on proposed development that can substantially overburden their community with unsafe traffic. I also want to note that the city study puts a lot of focus on equity and fairness. We got a ton of support from District 1, perhaps the most support of any district in Menlo Park. The city study also makes clear that District 1 has suffered the most from all of the development in Menlo Park, something city council has allowed without sufficient regard for fairness or equity. This initiative would give residents in District 1 more of a say on development near their homes than they've ever had. It would help preserve their low density residential neighborhoods as much as every other low density residential neighborhood in Menlo Park, perhaps even more so given that there's historically been a focus on building in District 1, and the homes tend to be more affordable there than the rest of Menlo Park, and prime targets as investment properties for developers to buy and build on. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is calling in from 8448, followed by Ronan Vengosh, and I'll ask the caller to state your name for the record before making comment, please. Hello, this is Kelly Blythe. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a resident of Suburban Park and I support the ballot measure. And I absolutely support more homes in Menlo Park, more uh, low income ho housing. But what the ballot measure is trying to do is get developers to work with residents in the neighborhoods where they're trying to develop and overdevelop uh, a particular neighborhood and change the character and change the safety of that neighborhood by increasing traffic uh, from what it is to something significantly more, which affects our kids and affects the bike riders and the joggers and the dog walkers. And we would respectfully suggest that the city council structure with the districts don't represent Menlo Park residents in that three of the five can choose what's going to happen in your district and your council member can't stop it. So this takes that problem away and makes it a democratic process just like it should be uh, to keep the characters of our neighborhood in terms of safety and, and density where they are now. So I, I'm glad the ballot measure received the support it did citywide, and we look forward to having it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Ronan Bengosh, followed by Keith Diggs. Hi, everybody. Mayor Nash and Council, thanks for letting me talk. Um, I want to uh, share with you kind of a, a little bit of a family history here. Um, my wife and I have been living in the city since 2003. Uh, we rented our home here until 2011 when we uh, purchased our 1700 square foot home in Suburban Park. 
Um, you know, at the time, it was a scary move. It cost us uh, most of our savings and a big loan uh, in addition. And 11 years later, it's uh, now uh, probably worth more than twice as much as we paid for it. Um, you know, if you believe the numbers to buy a house in, in the suburban park area, you need over $2 million. Uh, this is insanity. Almost nobody can afford to buy a house in Silicon Valley these days unless they've hit the jackpot. Um, my boys, you know, two of which are finishing MA and other ones in college, uh, they grew up in this community. Um, they will not be able to live here. They're not going to be able to afford to do so. And they'll probably end up uh, leaving the Bay Area, probably the state. I've seen so many other young uh, families and, and uh, people leaving uh, for that reason. And it makes no sense to me. You know, worst of all, this is self-inflicted. There's no shortage of space in the Bay Area. There's no shortage of, um, I guess, ability to, to build. Uh, what we have is a shortage of political will and an overabundance of nimby, nimbyism. We, we just need to build more housing. Um, my neighbors talked about, you know, preserving the character of our neighborhoods. Uh, minimizing traffic and so forth, but I got the, the character of our neighborhoods is our neighbors and we're pushing them out because they can't afford to live here. Um, it's also our children who know that they won't be able to buy a house here and so they choose to leave the area. This makes no sense to me. You know, I, I, sympath I sympathize with those that want things to remain the same, but, but life's about change. It's about making decisions and trade-offs, and you can't expect to live in the middle of Silicon Valley, close to employment centers and everything else the Bay Area has to offer and demand to live in a village. It's selfish, it's irresponsible. We need to grow beyond this, but there's even a bigger issue here, which is that the sprawl that's caused by this misguided single family zoning is causing massive commutes, it's clogging up roads, it's polluting the air, it also means that our neighborhoods are not walkable or even safely bikeable. Uh, and all this means that we continue to burn more fossil fuels, pollute the environment, it exacerbate climate change. Um, it's time to go beyond this, folks. And I urge the city council uh, to you know, do what they can to oppose this terrible, terrible uh, ballot proposition. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam City Mayor. Council Member Mueller, is that you? Yeah, may I speak? Thank you. Madam Mayor, can, I just want to clarify for the public that right now at this time, the only action before the council is to accept this report. And so to the extent that people may feel the need to speak a second time on the second action I know on this item, people may want to reserve comment. So I just wanted to raise that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. Point well taken. Thank you. So our next speaker is Keith Diggs, followed by Ruth Schechter. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Keith Diggs. I'm the Housing Elements Manager for Yimby Law. Um, I want to advise the commission to uh, accept the report. Um, I wrote in a letter earlier, I think it speaks for itself, um, just wanted to give a little personal touch and respond to some of the comments. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of fear of uh, change um, from a lot of people who own what are presumably by now way over uh, half a million dollar homes, if not seven figure homes. Um, and I, I understand that, but I want to share that change applies to a lot of the rest of us too. You know, I grew up in Fairfax County, Virginia, looks a lot like Menlo Park, um, had a lot of the amenities. It was a nice childhood and, uh, you know, went to a top 10 law school, worked for a non national nonprofit for seven years. And then I got priced out of Phoenix, Arizona, because uh, my rent went up 30%. And it's clearly because so many people are fleeing California because of the massive housing shortage there. Um, so th th it's frustrating to me that we're even having this conversation in the first place. Um, nothing about development requires anybody to give up the home they have. The problem is that so many of the rest of us are homeless. I don't even know where to register to vote because I don't have a home anymore. Um, and so, you know, 
apologize for getting emotional, but um, you know, th this is clearly a violation of uh, several of the new state law statutes. It's contrary to policy. And so I, I urge the council to accept the report and uh, oppose the measure. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Ruth Schechter, followed by Robert Jones. Hi, my name is Ruth Schechter. I'm a long-term resident of Menlo Park. I'd like to say this ballot measure is a citywide initiative and not just for the flood park site. And it was proposed as an effort to protect, protect residential neighborhoods from high density development that would dramatically change the core and heart of the neighborhood. The initiative does not prevent high density development, but it does require developers to work with a neighborhood that would be impacted, lets community residents vote on change rather than having the decision in the hands of the five council members. Chris, I have no problem with high density development where it's appropriate, close to stores, close to mass transportation, close to social amenities. I do have a problem with yielding to developers, needing to make maximum profit without listening to the concerns of the people that already live there. Putting these type of changes on the ballot means that the community's voice is heard and not just a vocal minority. I'd also I'd like to say Flood Park can still be used, just not at the density and scale that's being discussed. The measure would not have been introduced. The council had listened to our neighborhood concerns before green lighting, a potentially major project affecting the neighborhood. I also would like to say that the impacts that have been presented are very hypothetical. And we're talking about Menlo Park wide concerns and letting the voters have their voice, not being dictated to by state mandates. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Robert Jones, followed by Jennifer Schindler. Hello, yes, this is Robert, oops. Yeah, go right ahead, Robert. Can you hear me now? Yes, go right ahead. Um, my comments were well, uh, focuses on the next item, which is two. So I know that the public now for the area is making their comments. So I'll reserve that for J2. Perfect. Thank you, Robert. So our next speaker will be Jennifer Schindler, followed by Jennifer Michel. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Nash and council members. Uh, my name is Jennifer Schindler. I've lived in District 5 for 17 years. My children attended Oak Knoll, Hillview, and now MA. And I've been expanding my involvement in local issues uh, starting by reading the current and draft housing elements, the report that was reviewed tonight, as well as other key housing and planning priorities for the city. I'm opposed to this ballot measure and have already started educating and activating my neighbors and friends in Menlo Park to defeat this measure. I object to it for many reasons, and two key concerns that I'll highlight here tonight um, are that it increases barriers to new affordable housing, which contradicts many of the critical principles and goals laid out by our general plan and the housing element. And second, that it has no expiration. Here in Menlo Park and across the peninsula, shortages of affordable housing are hurting our families, hurting our community diversity, hurting local businesses, the quality of our schools and the environment. We've heard myriad examples of these impacts tonight. The city has intentionally set specific goals that reflect how we aspire to change, including the goals set out in these housing elements. And this measure, if passed, requires many of those identified opportunities for affordable housing to overcome huge new hurdles. It'll take longer, it'll cost more to, to realize these, these potential sites if they're ever actually able to be, to be built. The ballot measure isn't also, also isn't a short-term issue affecting just the flood park project and the 53 sites in the housing element. It is a very long-term problem because it doesn't expire. Future city councils, 
future housing elements, and future responses to state and local regulations would be restricted by the terms of this measure. It could become an albatross around the neck of our city governance for decades. Other key elements of our city governance, they're time bounded. General plans, housing elements, funding bonds, utility taxes. I think that's a requirement for responsible regulations and this measure doesn't fit that bill. As I've been talking to neighbors, they've all asked to learn more about this measure, to better understand the findings in the fantastic independent report, which was reviewed here tonight. And they've also asked to hear from their council members um, on the council members view about this measure. So I hope that our members here uh, and for the council will actively engage in this public dialogue ahead of the November election. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Jennifer Michelle, followed by a caller ending in 4208. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, allowing me to speak. My name is Jennifer Michelle. I have lived in Menlo Park for the majority of my life. I am currently a proud renter and our IEP student is over, uh, is about to start third grade at upper campus um, in the fall. And um, I am going to reserve my comments for uh, item J2. However, um, <laughs> our lovely neighbors have, um, I just really need to speak up to some of our neighbors such as Buck um, and others who are insinuating that people who are calling in are not longtime residents and don't have a vested interest in um, the neighborhoods, maybe because we're not homeowners, but I, you know, already determined that uh, I am a stakeholder, both professionally and, um, uh, you know, prof personally. Um, but I really want to encourage um, these uh, consultants, job well done. And, um, and please don't be discouraged by the <laughs> comments that you've heard so far. Uh, you've really done a great job. And this is just an assessment. There's no way to actually know the impacts of anything, right? That's all of us are ever doing as consultants is giving you our professional, you know, expert advice on that subject. So I appreciate your hard work. Um, and I would like to encourage um, the council to accept the report and move on. And thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is um, calling in. And then the one following our call-in is Wayne Muse. And so for our caller ending in 4208, I'll ask that you state your name for the record. Again, this is caller ending in 4208. Hello, can yes. you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, the uh, report that the, the city uh, financed, it's all speculation. I am for this ballot measure. I think the, I think it should be taken out of the city council's hands and put into the voters. Thank you, and can we have your name for the record? Dave Hausler. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker will be Wayne Musi, followed by Sandeep Gupta. Hi, yes, this is Wayne Musi. I've uh, lived in suburban parks since uh, January of 2000. And uh, I didn't initially expect to speak tonight. Um, but after hearing all of uh, what I've heard tonight during the council meeting, 
I decided I had to speak. So first off, I want to say that, you know, if we were looking at teachers and staff being at this site and it being for them, that would be great. But that is not what is in the developer's interest, you know, when you rezone this for them. You know, they will not, you don't know what they will do. So you need to keep that in mind. And, you know, and I actually, that reminds me, Ray Mueller, you know, it's like, yes, it's great that, uh, you know, this will, you know, end up getting on the ballot. And we understand that. But the reason we're out here talking, so many people are representing Menlo Park in this area is because you're not, you know, we're speaking, but no one is listening. Even our council member, I don't feel like is speaking. So that's why we're out here, Ray. So just keep that in mind uh, when it comes uh, voting time. So the next thing that I want to bring up, not just that is this for teachers or not, but, you know, yes, you know, uh, I think it was Ruth or, uh, you know, that mentioned that this is a blunt instrument. Well, yes, it is. Um, it is a blunt instrument. No, it's Evelyn. Evelyn mentioned this is a blunt instrument. We have to do that because, you know, we have no other choice. We're not being listened to. You know, there are many other sites that are more suitable for what's going on out here, but yet they're not being considered. It's being targeted to one location. And that's not, that's not you know, reasonable for the whole city. I've lived here for a long time. That's not reasonable. That's not what I've become accustomed to. You know, and so I do believe I agree with Ruth and Buck that, you know, we definitely, you know, zoning needs to be, you know, at least represented. And if not, then guess what? The people are going to speak up. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. So zoning is now going back to the people. So you need to, you know, it, it's like it's just it's crazy to me that I'm not being represented by my council member. So I will keep that in mind. And then lastly, the only thing I want to add is. Yes, District 5, I get it. Beautiful homes up there. I, I completely get it. I don't live there. I live closer to 101. But you know what? How much affordable housing do you have in your in your neighborhood? Would you be willing to open up some of the sites there? That's what I want to know. You know, it's like, let's look at all the sites. Let's make it a process that looks across the board at everything, not just one little teeny site snuggled in with 101, horrible, you know, mass transit. And this is it just, it's crazy. And I'm going to keep in mind all of this, you know, when it comes to election time. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Sandeep Gupta, followed by Michael Levinson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. I'd like to thank the city council members for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Sandeep Gupta. I'm a resident of Menlo Park for the last five years. I love this city. My family has made this home. I'm making a comment in support of the initiative. You all understand that housing is needed. You know, that's not pocket science in Bay Area, especially, right? At the same time, I am really concerned about the way it is being done. Few council members can choose to make decisions for the districts that they don't represent. That is why so many of the city residents, and this is not about one particular neighborhood or a particular site, so many city residents supported this volunteer-led grassroots effort, right? There was no developer money and all that which is going to come. We are pretty sure about that later on in some, you know, against this initiative. However, the safety of our kids and families is important to the residents. And that was evident to me and other volunteers when we went for signature gathering across the city. The traffic from commercial and high density residential buildings in a single family neighborhood is just, especially during weekends, evenings, when kids are playing on streets, neighbors are taking a walk, connecting with other neighbors. This is not being thought through properly. The report that was just presented um, was, in fact, there is no clear impact of the ballot measure, negative impact on economic, climate, and in fact, no clear impact on equity. Only words like potential impact were talked about. Um, not really sure uh, how, how that is a certain report when every slide had potential impact, potential impact. Um, the negative impacts like traffic on Bay Road and Ravenswood, Middlefield, that we live through every single day is going to be real. And that is getting lost in average vehicular traffic because average numbers versus what happens in a particular uh, area, it, it, it's just not the same. And um, earlier in the meeting, we were talking about climate change and how it, this should be an important factor. 
how is building a high resident uh, high density housing in an area with no public transportation good for that i don't understand um, and another thing this initiative does not prevent building high density housing in areas that are more appropriate with the restaurant shops and public transit especially so and it would not impact city council's ability to add low income housing as needed uh, because there are enough sites, as again the report points out. So I would highly encourage um, the city council members to think about that when they uh, vote on the action coming up and in sub, you know, and support the initiative. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Michael Levinson, followed by Anne Dietrich. Hello, uh, this is Michael Levinson. I've lived in Allied Arts for almost 10 years. I have young kids who go to Oak Knoll um, and I strongly oppose this ballot measure. Uh, everyone has been you know, talking about how they're not opposed to housing, just not in this particular site, just not in their particular neighborhood, just not this project. And that's why we have what we have in Menlo Park, which is a situation where no one can afford to live here and we build almost nothing. One of the speakers earlier made most of my points, so I won't repeat them, uh, about how this measure is a one-way door that's permanent that will make it so that these sites that are perfect housing sites, large tracts of land where schools used to be, uh, where churches might want to build housing, like very reasonable uh, parcels, will have to go to a vote and it will never happen. So they, they may say they support housing, but this measure in effect will make it impossible to build in these sites. These are not high density sites. These are pretty low density apartments. And in the particular flood park proposal, we are talking about opposing housing for teachers and school workers who desperately need it. A lot of the teachers that we know are commuting from far away to teach our kids. And I just think it's unconscionable to oppose these types of projects. One of the speakers said, hey, you know, you guys who live in some of these other neighborhoods, you know, would you support more housing in your neighborhoods? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. I live on College Avenue. I had a canvasser for the ballot prop come knock on my door to talk to me. And she said, we're not opposed to housing. We want housing near transit. And <laughs> I live in downtown of the park, basically. It's 0.6 miles from the train station. That is near transit. So the people who are supporting this measure don't want to build. We need to build. And I strongly urge the council to take a strong position, pro-housing and oppose this measure. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Anne Diedrich, followed by a caller from a Galaxy S10. Hello, um, this is Anne Diedrich. Can you hear me? Yes, yes go right. right ahead. Wonderful. Um, I have lived on Laurel Street for 23 years. Um, I oppose this ballot measure. Um, I am actually in favor of the housing that's being uh, proposed on the SRI site, which is just steps from my door. So I guess that makes me a Yumbi. Um, and a part of the reason I feel this way has to do with literature on this topic. And I'm just going to refer to a couple of things, which is Jenny Schutz's book, Fixer Upper, How to Repair America's Broken Housing System. Um, in addition to that, The Left NIMBY Canon by Noah Smith. The Home, Over, Home Voter Hypothesis by William Fitchell and The Paradox of Democracy by Sean Illing. Uh, the point of these texts is I keep hearing people saying we want to be democratic in deciding uh, what we want to do with our property. But actually, when we go for referendums like this, it tends to be almost the opposite of um, being democratic. And that is that the few people who have the most resources and the most privilege have an easy time setting up measures that block development. And so instead of doing what's best for the community as a whole, when we allow this hyper-local decision-making, we have a tendency to do what's best for those who are already in place. And I think that is particularly concerning in Menlo Park when you look at our history of restrictive covenants and redlining. So we set up a structure, and clearly it was before almost all of us lived here, where, um, uh, you know, my own husband couldn't have bought in our neighborhood at the time our neighborhood was built. And uh, we reinforce that when we are unwilling to think about building in a way that allows uh, us being more forward-looking and integrated. 
So I feel really uncomfortable with that bit of, of our history uh, and the way we are reinforcing it by not building. And I think that um, the focus on hyper-local decision-making gets in the way with what's the best for the greatest number of people. And I also hear people keep um, dismissing the council's uh, participation in this, but we have an incredibly thoughtful council who are reviewing these proposals and thinking about negotiating the right amenities. And I think they are better positioned to figure out what's best moving forward and negotiating appropriately with developers than working through referendums and um, and petitions. So um, that, that is my take. So I, I am against this current measure. I am in favor of thoughtful building and I am supportive of the council and what I've seen them do in my time here. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is coming from a Galaxy S10 and then a Dean 11. And for our caller on the Galaxy, if you could please state your name for the record. So this is a call for our commenter calling in from a Galaxy S10. Hello. Yes, perfect. Yeah, I'm, my name is Bernard Sayese, and I'm a resident of Menlo Park. And I support the ballot. And I have to say that I also support the housing for teachers and things like that. But I support it for the amount of units that is allowed by law, which it would be like 20 or 30 for teachers. You know, and that would be an excellent opportunity to give teachers a, a place to be. But what they're doing is they don't guarantee them that it's gonna be for teachers. They only, and then they, they're saying that they're gonna do like 90 units. You can build like 30 or 40 units for teachers and they're not doing that. It's, it, it is, I don't understand why they can not build just 40 units for teachers or thing like that, then instead of making a high rise in the middle of a single housing development, you know? So it, it, it basically, you get to the conclusion that it's the greed of the developer and the city council to solve some problems that they messed up beforehand, you know? And then, as residents, we should be able to vote what we think is right for our community, you know, not what, what are we, the dictatorship or something like that from, from five councilmen that is obvious that they don't represent us. And that's why we're talking that we need to have a say, you know? Okay, that's, that's, that's about it. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Adina Levin, followed by Katie Baruzzi. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council members, staff, and consultants. I uh, wanted to really express appreciation for uh, the consultant report that really uh, clearly shows uh, what the ballot measure uh, actually would do in terms of making it uh, difficult to build affordable housing, uh, making it difficult for the city to uh, address its obligations uh, to support to a, a, a further fair housing um, and starting with, not ending with, but starting with blocking affordable housing for teachers and uh, school workers. Um, from uh, paying attention to the city's housing element process, um, it's uh, not easy to uh, uh, you know, provide uh, zones and sites for affordable housing. Um, it's particularly difficult because we have you know, dug ourselves in Menlo Park, especially and in the Bay Area uh, and in California, um, such a deep hole and uh, uh, making it harder to build affordable housing is the furthest from uh, what we should be doing. Um, in addition to, you know, the report shows that in addition to uh, 
uh, blocking affordable housing at the flood school site. It would also block uh, numerous sites that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, church sites, for example, imagine a church with elderly parishioners that want to put affordable housing on a parking lot that would require that church to have a vote of the entire city. The report said that in the city of Saratoga, where they have such a measure in place, they haven't seen any housing. That's the effect of this kind of measure. Um, so, um, and um, uh, also um, I was uh, uh, glad to see that the, um, the report called out that this uh, measure could really make this city uh, legally vulnerable in terms of the barriers it would uh, place to meeting the housing element obligations and towards affirmatively furthering uh, fair housing. Um, the state uh, is being much more serious and much more proactive in uh, uh, pursuing cities that are violating state housing law. And you know, here in Menlo Park, because of our history, because we were sued a couple of housing elements ago because we had never done a housing element. And so um, we got sued to uh, you know, uh, get us to start doing housing elements. And um, because we have some famous companies in our city, um, you know, the, the, the eyes of the world are going to be upon us. And um, this is something that's gonna make the city very vulnerable if this uh, passes. So I was really glad to see these things being um, uh, shown and exposed um, in the report. Um, and uh, I, I do hope that the city council uh, uh, steps up to uh, oppose this measure. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our final hand is Katie Baruzzi. Hi, city council. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I am going to focus very narrowly on a very specific request for you. I think a lot of people have made great points. A lot of people have made points that I don't personally agree with and I won't take the time to rebut them now. Um, I will say that I think this ballot measure is bad for a community in a couple of different key ways. And my hope is that you will find yourselves, your way as a council um, to unanimously express your opposition to it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you embrace the one project that we've all been talking about. Maybe you don't. But as a policy for our city, this is not great. Um, it's not great for the legal liability reasons. It's not great for the long-term um, growth and potential of our city. Um, it's also not great because fundamentally, I think, and we've even heard some of this tonight, there's, also, there's a lot of confusion. It's very easy to sow confusion about zoning issues and development. It's really easy to flood the proverbial zone as Steve Bannon likes to say, and so misinformation. It's hard for residents to wade through all of that and find the essential truths. It's hard to know who to trust. Um, you as council members, you have experts at your disposal. You have staff, you have consultants, you have advisors. Um, you have lots of time to deliberate and you have the ability to, to you know, put all of the decisions you make into context. And we as residents have the ability to vote for you um, and decide whether or not you are faithfully representing us. And we do that every four years and that's the wonderful thing about democracy. Um, please do not cede your, um, your authority in future planning for the city. Don't screw the future councils and which would also frankly screw our future residents. Um, I think that's a really important point. And I'll also say, um, and this was actually called out in that great and lengthy report that a lot of people probably haven't read. Um, it's not reasonable to say I support housing and I just think this will give the residents a voice and just enforce developers to work with residents. What we know from other cities that have done similar things is that people just don't bring projects forward. And when they do, they, may, they might spend hundreds of thousands of dollars like the Maybell project, 60 affordable housing units for seniors in Palo Alto that was well over $100,000 and didn't pass, didn't get built, ended up being 12 luxury homes and a place where seniors could have lived. So I, I just don't think this is a good idea for our city. Um, I definitely get that people are coming at you from different angles um, and that this is a tricky political time for some of you, but um, I urge you um, to dig deep and find a point of agreement and support, um, I, I guess, oppose actually the ballot measure, um, because I think it will matter. I think people look to you as leaders 
and want to see what you think about this and um, that will help them decide. Thanks so much. Thank you for your comment. So yeah, you can feel free to step up and we also have a few more hands raised. So if you can, again, just state your name for the record. <clears throat> My name is Paul Kalachi. I, um, I understand there would be an opportunity to speak to the next issue as well. I have two things, but I'd like to address the report first. First, I wanna make clear that I support um, both the flood school project and the initiative. I don't see them as being mutually exclusive. Um, I would point out relative to the report that the universe of potential outcomes with the initiative is absolutely identical to the universe of potential outcomes without the initiative. Voters can approve any R1 zoning made by council. For that reason, everything written in the city's report is speculative. It speculates about what voters will do, and it speculates about what city councils will do. Since the report admits the initiative will have very little short-term impact in the current RENA cycle, it speculates about what future voters and future councils will do on future RENA cycles that are nearly a decade away. The report gives no factual method for assigning its probabilities of what voters will do, and it makes no attempt to list and analyze past votes by voters in Menlo Park to determine voter risk, if any. Since Measure E in 1998, there have been six community-wide votes, four involving land use and numerous school bond measures. In all six measures, in all but one case, the voters either upheld council or if council was challenged by voters in a referendum, council deferred to voters by withdrawing the ordinance. In five of six occasions, either voters agreed with council or council agreed with voters. The one exception was measure E in 1998, voters referended and, re and then rejected a leaf blower ban that had been placed on the ballot by council. The most obvious interpretation for that is that Menlo Park voters sided with the little guy, the local gardeners who organized the referendum. Every precinct in Menlo Park voted for the little guy. Now, as far as one of the referendums, the dairy referendum serves as a good model because the dairy project, the original dairy project was referended. Council knew that they couldn't get it passed. They withdrew it. The group that referended renegotiated. They renegotiated a high density house of 40 units and that was approved by council and it moved on. So my recommend, recommendation to Menlo Park is you don't have to fear your voters um, and trust in the wisdom of your voters. I, I, I think it can work out for you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I do have an additional hand raise calling in from 9091. Ask again that you state your name for the record. Hi, this is Catherine Dumont. I'm a resident of Winfield Oaks. I want uh, to say how much I appreciate the due diligence done by the Menlo Park City Council in commissioning this report. Um, and I urge them to accept the report. Uh, the report reflects what we've seen in the latest housing element process, which showed us just how difficult it is to create affordable housing opportunities for future generations and how it is particularly hard to do so in a manner that avoids perpetuating the inequities imposed by past housing policies. I do hope that everyone, every resident in Menlo Park would read this report. Um, I think it certainly puts the lie to the assertion that people choose to live where they live because um, it shows that people live where they can afford to live. And this study supports the conclusion that this ballot measure sets up a direct conflict with Menlo Park's general plan by limiting the ability of our city's leaders to plan for housing that meets the needs of residents at a variety of income levels. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I saw a hand raised with a phone number ending in, uh, let me see if I can get back to it.
in 1747. I'm asking you to unmute now if you'd like to comment on this item. Please do state your name for the record. Okay, I'll go ahead and continue on. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the speakers and your heartfelt comments. I will now close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. Is there any discussion or does anyone want to make a motion? This is for um, receiving the report regarding the proposed initiative measure. And just for the record, we do. I don't believe we need any action on this item. It's just a receiving of report. Very good, thank you. So any comments? Uh, Council Member Combs. Mayor Nash, it's uh, Council Member Combs. Um, so um, yeah, I, I would concur. We, we received the report and, and read it. Um, and, you know, certainly I'm in favor of, of moving on to, to, to the next item where the council does have, have action to take. I, I do think it is, is important to, to point out, it was an, an extensive report um, it, it did uh, air some of the concerns I, I had when we initially issued this report or, or, or requested this report. And there was, fr from my perspective, in a number of instances, um, uh, lots of suggested correlations, but not clear causation um, between between two, two, two events. And so I, I don't think it's it's uh, um, you know important to go through in detail uh, all of the instances in which I, I saw that and I had had some concerns, uh, but I do think it is it is important for me to to point that out um, to point that um, it was a a a, a voluminous report um, and certainly came to some some very clear conclusions some of which I totally agree with and support. But some of which, like I said, it, it was was not clear exactly to me um, that there there was actual a, a causal correlation um, that that the report authors, uh, the consultants, uh, were were drawing. Um, and so, so with that, uh, again, but supportive of of receiving the report and moving on to the next item. Thank you. So we will move on to the next item, which is another public hearing, J2, Determination of Action Pursuant to Elections Code Section 9215 regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled A Citizen-Sponsored Initiative Measure to Amend the Land Use Element of the General Plan to Prohibit the City Council of the City of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single-family detached homes. To introduce the item is City Attorney Mira Doherty. Thank you, Mayor Nash and members of the City Council, Mira Doherty, City Attorney. On April 15th, as the Council knows, a petition for a proposed initiative was filed with the City. The petition proposed a citizen sponsored initiative proposing to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council from designating or rezoning properties designated very low residential or low residential. The county and the city clerk verified the sufficiency of the petition. The petition gathered sufficient signatures to qualify for the ballot. The elections code required that following certification of the signature, city council would either adopt the ordinance without alteration or submit the ordinance to the voters. Um, the City Council also had the option to order a report analyzing the potential impacts of the measure. On June 28th, the City Council ordered the report. That report was the one that was just presented to you um, that the Council just received, filed, and considered. Following uh, receipt of the report, the Elections Code requires that within 10 days of the report being presented to the Council, 
the city council must either adopt the measure or order an election and place the measure on the ballot. So these two options are before you this evening. If the council adopts the measure itself, the first option, then 30 days following adoption of the measure, the general plan would be amended in the manner set forth in the measure. The second option is to place the measure on the ballot. If the council elects this option, then the city is required to place the measure on the next regular election, which would be November 8th, 2022. Um, the resolution placing the measure on the ballot, that's option two, establishes the ballot language to be submitted to the voters. That's the box that uh, asks the question with a yes or a no answer. The resolution also establishes dates for submission of ballot arguments for and against the measure, as well as dates for the public inspection period um, and rebuttal arguments. Um, the current resolution does not provide any direction to any one council member or a subcommittee or a single council member to draft arguments for or against the measure. If the council does wish to have council members draft ballot arguments, then I'm, I'm gonna recommend that we add language to that effect before the resolution is approved. I've prepared that language and I can um, provide the council some, some language to that effect. Um, if the council does not want to provide any direction on council member ballot arguments, then I would like to make one change to the resolution. And if the council is inclined to go with this option too, then I'd uh, like to read this language into the record. The change would essentially revise the deadline set in the county's election calendar for submission of ballot arguments. I would like to move that date up um, pursuant to an elections code provision um, that allows and specifies that there needs to be sufficient time for ballot arguments and for a selection of uh, author of the ballot argument. Um, this would provide the city clerk sufficient time to exercise her ministerial obligation to identify authors of arguments if the council itself does not author or direct who will draft the ballot argument for and against the measure. If the proponents submit an argument for the measure, they um, uh, have the option of, of taking priority and having that argument um, be printed in the ballot. If there are uh, no authors for or against um, for or against the measure uh, as between the council and the proponents, then um, bona fide groups of citizens um, may submit arguments. And this is uh, the change that I'd like to make um, would clarify that process and um, provide the city clerk additional time. And with that, I do not have anything further. I'm here to take questions, um, should you have any. I do have one question and that is what would the time, what is the new date? Thank you. So I'd like to change the deadline for sub submission of arguments to be August 9th. The current county deadline is August 19th. August 9th would be 14 days from today. Um, Typically, we follow the county elections calendar. The elections code allows the county to establish certain deadlines. The elections code also specifies that the city may require ballot arguments to be submitted 14 days from the um, call of the election, which would be today. Um, the, I, I propose that the public inspection period that the county has set remains the same. So that would be August 19th to August 29th and that the rebuttal argument deadline that the county has set remained the same, and that's October, uh, I'm sorry, August 29th, 2022. Thank you. Madam Mayor, may I ask a question? Yes, I was just gonna call for, are there any council questions, clarifying questions? Uh, council Member Mueller. So my only concern, City Attorney Doherty, is that, I mean, Doherty, is that we, are, if we do, if we do uh, 
move it to the ninth. What's the last day for withdrawal of the of the measure? Is it the twelfth? You're, you're muted. Thank you. Per state law, uh, last day to withdraw is 88, to withdraw the measure from the ballot is 88 days prior to the election, which is August 12th. The county election calendar references August 17th as the last day to withdraw the measure. So you're proposing we put in our, the, the, that if there is a, a ballot if there is a ballot argument that it be put in before the last date of withdraw for withdrawal. Yeah, and, and my reasoning for it is that the county, the county elections calendar has the ballot argument deadline, um, the, the, the ballot argument deadline of, of August 29th, at, I'm sorry, it's August um, 19th at 5 p.m is the exact instant when the public examination period um, commences. And the public examination period must be open for 10 days. If the city council is not authoring a ballot argument or directing um, the city clerk on how on, on uh, or direct or, or, or if the council does not Receive direction, a council member does not receive direction from the council to work with a particular entity or person on drafting the ballot argument. Um, then my concern is that with the county calendar, the city clerk has to instantaneously at 5 p.m. on August 19th make a selection on which uh, ballot argument to publish and to um, hold out for inspection and immediately open the inspection period. And I, I don't know whether or not that's a flaw or by design, but we are not required to follow the county's election calendar with respect to these dates. And so I'd suggest that in order to aid the city clerk and her ministerial obligations to identify um, an author of a ballot argument for and against that we provide her additional time. But my concern is why the ninth, oh, but as opposed to doing it like the fourteenth, two days after the bat after the date for ballot measure withdrawal. Yeah, so the ninth is fourteen days from today, and um, elections code nine two eight six, I believe it is. Excuse me, I don't have it up, but I will momentarily. Um, suggest that the city should establish a ballot argument deadline 14 days from calling the election. But the county does allow us to do it later. Correct. Okay, so I would, I mean, I personally would be more comfortable waiting until after the 12th, which would be the date, of, date for withdrawal, because I would like to see, I know parties are engaged in settlement discussions and I would like to understand where those settlement discussions go and how they ended prior to uh, prior to submittal of a ballot argument. So that would be my, that's where I'd be. I don't know where my council members are on that. Thank you. Thank you. City Attorney Doherty, do you, um, would it present, I, I would agree with council member Mueller that it makes sense to me to try to have the date set at the 14th, which allows us to um, pursue any negotiations up through the 12th. Is there an issue with having the 14th and then only five days? I think that'd be acceptable. Thank you. Are there any other clarifying questions from council before we open the public hearing? All right, I would like to open the public hearing. Um, this, we will have a time limit given um, the number of speakers that we have seen of one and a half minutes for public comment. City Clerk Heron, could you please call for public comments on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. 
So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item J2, determination of action pursuant to election code section 9215 regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsor initiated initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated for zoned or single family detached homes to engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If you are participating in chambers, please step up to the podium now. And our first speaker will be Gina Sadaria. Good evening, counselors. My name is Gina Sudaria, and I'm the superintendent of the Ravenswood City School District. Although tonight I'm not speaking as my official, in my special, official capacity, rather as a neighbor and fellow community member. As many of you know, Ravenswood is exploring building a site on a currently zoned R1 parcel that is the home of the former school flood school. After much thought, evaluation, and due diligence, Ravenswood created a proposal that will achieve two critical goals providing staff housing while also bringing in a reliable revenue stream to the district. As you may know, we recently surveyed our staff on their housing opportunities and the results were bleak. Um, about 2% are currently unhoused, 43% are considering leaving the district because of their housing situation, and 85% of our staff have household incomes that make them eligible for affordable housing. And this is based on a third of our staff reporting a safe, secure, affordable housing option um, is not very feasible. This project would also help close regional funding gaps when accounting for student need. Ravenswood gets less than half the funding per students as Menlo Park City School District and other surrounding districts. The proposed um, project would bring in about 500,000 of operating funds annually. Um, this may not be enough for down payment in Menlo Park, but it, it would be a meaningful amount of money for our district our size. A smaller project proposal like a 40 to 60 unit will not bring any revenue to the district. It may not even be a viable affordable uh, viable affordable housing project on the site. I would call attention to just one portion of the report, which reads, the ballot measure can then be seen to continue the same cycle, of putting the highest densities and most affordable units in the area of the community as predominantly lower income, marginalized and communities of color. This just does not sit right with me and I know it doesn't sit right with you. Making it more difficult for Ravenswood to enjoy the funding levels of their surrounding district or to be able to live near the, their students isn't a Ravenswood issue, it's a Menlo Park issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Leslie Feldman, and this will also be the final call for public comment on item J2. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my comments. My name is Leslie Feldman and I'm a resident of the Flood Triangle neighborhood. I'm a home homeowner and a mom of two young children and I strongly oppose this ballot measure. I have seen firsthand the impact of the lack of affordable housing has had on teacher recruitment and retention in our area. Earlier, some people made claims that the development of affordable housing, particularly at the flood site, will negatively affect the current character of that neighborhood. This perspective is short-sighted. If our schools can't recruit and, re and retain great teachers, that will have a much, much more detrimental impact on our neighborhoods. Ravenswood City School District is trying to do something to improve its ability to educate its students, and this will improve the quality of our entire community. This takes us, this ballot measure takes us in the wrong direction, and I encourage you to oppose it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Bell Haven Empowered. Hi. <laughs> Hello, that Mayor. Mayor. I will. Mayor Nash, Vice Mayor Willison, Council Members Taylor, Combs, Mueller, and staff. At first, I'd like to thank the consultants for a robust and inclusive report. My name is Pamela Jones. I have lived in the Bellhaven neighborhood since the early 1970s. My family has been on the Mid Peninsula 
Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park since 1927. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, my parents actively proved discrimination in housing cells and, cells and rentals. I am third generation lived experience. I understand zoning and housing. The report states the ballot measure can be seen to continue the same cycle of putting the highest density and most affordable units in the area of a community that has predominantly lower and marginalized community of color. The petition began that led to the ballot measure when the Ravenswood City School District began looking at developing affordable housing on their property. There was no outcry uh, during the Connect Menlo General Plan that the previous council elected citywide in November of 2016 voted on a general plan that changed zoning in one area of the city only and opened the massive uh, the door to massive development. Uh, I urge the council to submit the initiative to the voters at the general election to be held on November 8th. 2022 in order to allow the entire city an opportunity to make the decision that is truly in the best interest of the city and that will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Karen Grove followed by Adina Levin. Hello again. Um, previously, I went out of turn and said, I hope that you oppose ballot measure. So I won't say that again. I do wanna say, um, I really hope that there can be a solution that results in the ballot measure being um, removed from the ballot. And so with that in mind, I do support the proposed changes to the schedule and that's it. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your comment. So Adina Levin followed by Jennifer Michelle. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members, Adina Levin, um, Menlo Park resident. And um, given the uh, really powerful information that there is available about um, this um, ballot measure and the amount of confusion that there is on the topic in this city, um, the City Council really has an important role to play in um, communication uh, about this ballot measure. Um, in terms of the timing, I think uh, changing the timing to allow uh, the, the measure to be pulled from the ballot if, if possible um, seems desirable, but also leaving enough time to be able to um, have ballot arguments that communicate to voters about what this ballot measure actually does in terms of harming affordable housing and um, in enabling uh, city council members to uh, uh, step up and communicate to voters about the impacts of this ballot measure and the harm that it would cause in terms of um, providing affordable housing for uh, people in the city of Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our final hand is Jennifer Michelle. Hello, me again. Thank you so very much uh, for allowing me to speak again. Um, so I actually had been approached um, publicly um, at the off the grid um, on a Wednesday night um, by, the, um, by the people looking to get this ballot initiative um, in place and I, um, I was immediately concerned because um, I was informed that the um, initiative would not impact me, um, but they don't know anything about me. Um, and I've already overcome homelessness in the city of Menlo Park while working in the city of Menlo Park about 20 years ago. And um, I, I just, I, I'm ashamed, I'm saddened, I'm concerned. Um, and I'm concerned that this was maybe done in bad faith. I, I know that everybody is concerned about safety, but I think um, there is a lot of confusion. And I think we, we are incumbent upon each other to 
make sure that we know exactly what this, how this would impact us um, and our city and our future generations here. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be James Pistorino. James, are you able to unmute your end? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, perfect. Thank you. There we go. Thanks. Uh, again, my name is James Pistorino, Menlo Park resident. I'm speaking only on behalf of myself. I just, one thing I was curious about here is I kept on hearing various numbers about, uh, about how the Ravenswood School District is, you know, getting less money than other districts and needs more money and that kind of thing. I did know, I just always focus on the facts. I did notice an article in the Palo Alto Online um, indicated in uh, October last year, indicating a statement by the chief business officer of the Ravenwood School District, looks like his name was Will Egger, stating the Ravenswood School District was spending approximately $30,000 per student per year, whereas the Menlo Park School District was spending slightly less than $20,000. So I just always focus on maybe getting the facts right. And I also did want to note um, I think one thing that sort of independent of this particular issue was what I heard from many commentators was um, basically the lack of democracy that's at issue here with the switch to the district-wide elections. People in the various districts can't, their votes cannot affect what happens in their district because it can be outweighed by uh, the votes of three other council members who don't represent them. So I, I think that's an interesting um, point across many, many issues that the council uh, uh, faces. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your comment. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. Oh, Mayor Nash, apologize for the interruption. I did have a That's secondary fine. hand I raised. See. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and I know uh, the speaker spoke on the last item. You're coming up as Galaxy S10. So I will request again that you state your name for the record, please. Do I need to open reopen public? Did we officially close the public? I hearing? did close. Go ahead and officially okay. reopen. <laughs> I will reopen the public hearing for the speaker. Thank you, Mayor Nash, most appreciated. So again, going to Galaxy S10, you should have the ability to unmute your end. So this is a call for the Galaxy S10. Yeah, hi. Perfect. Yeah, my name is Bernard again. Thank you. Bernard says you say I'm a resident of Mendel Park. And I don't understand the council and thing like that. Let the people of Mendel Park have their say. You know, it, it seems like the city council doesn't trust us. Uh, I mean, if it's right, we're going to vote for the right thing, you know? We, there, you know, so do not put, don't let the time go by, extend it, and things like that. Just put it to the vote of the people and let them vote and let the, the people of Menlo Park decide what they want. You know, that is basically, I think it's what we all want. We want to have a, a say in this and by extending it, it doesn't do no good. Just put it to the vote and move on. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I did have one other hand raised, looking for Gina. Gina? So this will be the last call for Gina to provide comment on item J2. And the hand 
down. So Mayor Nash you may now continue. Thank you. I will now reclose the public hearing and open for city council discussion. Does anyone want to start the discussion? Council Member Combs. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I, I did want to, throughout the evening, and I think even in the report, there's been lots of complaining with specifically the flood school site, that, that project or that proposed project and the initiative. And, and certainly uh, the two are linked and, and related, but, but are, are, are separate. Um, but before we delve into a, a discussion um, specifically about, about the initiative and, and just to be clear, I am, I am supportive of, of obviously uh, placing the initiative on, on, on the ballot. Um, uh, but given the conflation and, and the comments between the flood school site and, and, and the initiative, I did want to speak specifically about, about the flood school site um, since it came up obviously often in, in public comments um uh throughout uh the, the night and, and i i, I want to say I, I appreciate um all of the public comments uh it was um uh informative uh and enriching hearing hearing from everyone hearing from the perspectives obviously a number of you uh certainly not all but a number of you i've uh talked to individually over the past uh, uh few weeks about about this 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 issue that our community is facing um, but I want to say, as, as a council member that has been most involved and most engaged with the, the key parties as it relates to uh, the flood school site and obviously to some degree the initiative, uh, what I've seen is not a discussion about or a disagreement about the, the value of affordable housing or the desire to actually have affordable housing uh, on, on this site. Now, I'm not saying that there possibly doesn't exist voices in the community opposed to affordable housing on the site, but with the, the, the stakeholders that I've engaged and with those spearheading the initiative, um, the discussion hasn't been, um, and with the discussion with the school district has not been about uh, not having affordable housing uh, uh, or even not having uh, 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 affordable housing that is, is, is much more dense than, than that, that community, which is R1U. I think the discussion has been about, and the disagreement has been about what that density should look like. What actually is that, that density? What's, what's the right number? Um, and, and that's where there has been disagreement between uh, the school district and, and the community members I've, I've engaged. But no one has said, um, again, of, of the leaders of the initiative that I've engaged, that they are opposed to affordable housing at the, that site. And no one has said that they are opposed to, um, and have, they have made clear their support for dozens of units at the site. Um, certainly it is, it is a, a, a number that is, that is less than what the school district feels is the right number for, for it. Um, but, but I wanna make it clear that that's the discussion um, the discussion is about is between uh, a community saying, or at least some in a community saying, that they think a project may be too dense, um, and a developer, and in this case, in the school district, um, wanting a density higher than what a community feels uh, is is most appropriate. Um, but again, no one has said that um, uh, uh, that. Uh, an affordable housing project should not take place, or that one uh, specifically targeted to, to the teachers and staff of Ravenswood School District. Uh, most of the people, again, that I've engaged with uh, in the suburban park community ha have embraced the idea of, of, of this sort of project. Um, it is just the, the density and the height um, at four stories and at 90 units that they thought was that they have concluded many of them uh, is is not not right for for this specific neighborhood and for this specific parcel. Um, so I want to make that that clear. Um, and, and and again, I know that's a little bit separate from specifically uh, a discussion about about the initiative and proceeding. Uh, but to reiterate, there I'm I'm uh, totally in support of 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 putting um, um, you know putting the initiative on the ballot. And again, as the council member that has been most engaged uh, with with the, the the main parties as it relates to the initiative, 
I'm I'm supportive and of of, uh, of us having as much time as 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 we can have uh, uh, to try to reach reach some some resolution um, that might result in the uh, the ballot uh, initiative being pulled. Thank you very much. Other comments? Would anyone like to make a motion? All right, I will move. I'm okay. <laughs> Council member. <laughs> I'll, I'll second your motion, uh, but I'll, I'll let you make it fully and then I'll second it. Well, I would like to um, put the initiative on the ballot um, with the um, 14th as the deadline for the arguments. Um, as with the wording that um, City Attorney Doherty um, had and then the revised date that Councilmember Mueller proposed. Perhaps you could read the motion that the mayor is making into the record and then um, I will read the revision to section six of the resolution. I can uh, do, I can read the motion for the resolution. Um, did we need any further clarification on the drafting of the arguments at this time? Okay. And then I do see Vice Mayor Willison's hand raised. Vice Mayor Willison. Uh, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I noticed in the resolution um, to put it on the ballot, there's language that says that the council um, desires to submit the initiative to the voters. Um, I'm not comfortable with that statement and I'd prefer to say something as the, the city council agrees or submits or um, a more objective or- It was compelled. <laughs> I would be fine with adding that to or changing the motion to whatever um, council member comes. I'll let you choose the word. No, wait, I, uh, I, I'm actually gonna defer to the vice mayor. Um, whatever, I, I, I think her, her sentiment is, is, is correct and understandable and whatever verbiage she wants to go with, I am, I'm supportive. Um, I guess um, city attorney Doherty would, um, submit or you're the you know the legal language better than I do on these kinds of things yeah I think you can you can change it as as you wish um replacing desires with submit wouldn't make sense because it would read submit to. Submit. I don't I sorry I don't have the um printed out one in front of me so I'm kind of um if you have a recommendation if the council would like to change the recital to read, whereas the city council, the city of Menlo Park resolves to submit the initiative to the voters at the general election, perhaps that's a more neutral term. I'll defer to your recommendation if, if the motion maker um, agrees. That is fine. Um, and then um, Mayor um, Nash, may I make another comment or? Certainly. Okay. Um, I just want to um, agree with my colleagues about the, um, the August 14th um, date for um, ballot um, arguments. Um, and I just want to reiterate to the public um, what I've previously stated um, which that I was um, publicly stating my opposition to this ballot measure. I stated previously that um, the known impacts to the flood um, school site were concerning enough for me, um, but given the um, report, I would say that the results I thought were pretty damning on this ballot measure, I'm very concerned. 
about it for many of the reasons that were outlined um, in public comment this evening. And um, I, you know, if, if, uh, if, yeah. So I just hope that the, the public reads the report um, and thinks about the long-term consequences um, that this could have. I also want to assure um, the members who spoke tonight of the public and others um, who I've either spoken to or who have written in that um, we, I think I can speak for all of us that we do listen and we do um, understand concerns that are raised. Um, uh, for me as a representative, I think I have to be accessible and take in um, concerns raised and consider them and think very thoughtfully about them. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we make a vote and we make a decision that might not always be in the way that those who are advocating for one position or another may like, but that doesn't mean that we're not thoughtful and that we don't listen. So I just wanted to just to say that on behalf of the council, at least or, or myself. Um, so thank you. Mayor, Madam Mayor, may I make a statement? Yes. So I just wanted to uh, just indicate uh, a few things. One, you know, there's, gosh, there are so many comments and that uh, in the heat of the moment, I think uh, talking about the past may have mischaracterized, but having, having actually voted against Connect Menlo, but then later seeing a lot of the objections that I raised at that time about it not being ready addressed over time. The one thing I would point out to, to people that in that process and at the start of that process, the single family neighborhoods in Bellhaven were excluded specifically from connect Menlo up zoning. And the history of the city has been uh, during my tenures on council and prior to that, that there hasn't been extensive up zoning of single family neighborhoods. I have advocated for uh, the protection of those neighborhoods from traffic with barriers and things like that, that we really haven't had an opportunity to do yet, but we have seen the council looking at lowering speed limits and doing a number of modifications to try to make, try to make those neighborhoods and every neighborhood safer in Menlo Park from traffic. Tonight, uh, what I'd say candidly to both sides is I'm a little worried uh, because as you would expect in an evening like tonight, everyone came ready to bear with their arguments and fight. And I have to tell you all, you all did a great job of fighting. But the problem when we all fight is that we don't always listen to each other. And my hope, and I hope I don't sound too preachy and if you wanna ignore me, you can, but I hope that in the coming days that we take a moment and try to be empathetic toward each other because there is points on both sides to be addressed. And I actually am hopeful that with respect uh, to the flood school site, that there could be a resolution reached and that there even, and then going forward, the council could discuss how we try to address other issues that, that may be worthy of thinking about uh, uh, for, for those in the city who were concerned uh, that gave rise to supporting the measure. But I, I do think we actually are pretty close to getting uh, this, this site resolved in a way. And I think both sides, frankly, could, could see this measure go on the ballot and lose in a way that they wouldn't want to. Uh, so I, I hope that people can listen to each other empathetically and try to figure out how to resolve that. Uh, and then uh, lastly, what I would say uh, to folks is thank you for engaging. In a night like tonight, it's really hard uh, to say that without offending either side of you. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we're very lucky to live in a community where people are as engaged and thoughtful and bringing their concerns forward in the manner that you are. And my only hope is that at the end of the day, you might go back and listen to some of those concerns and see if we can come together as a community to reach a resolution short of the ballot box. And if we end up at the ballot box, we do. But I just encourage everyone at the outset, having seen this go down before and heard about it in the past, that when we do, we approach each other respectfully in a respectful debate. So thank you all.
Thank you. City Clerk Heron, would you please uh, restate the motion and call for a vote? Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I think I will defer to our city attorney, just given the amendments to the motion. Um, it is a motion by Mayor Nash with a second by City Council Member Co. Okay, it's a resol It's a motion to approve the resolution attached um, as attachment B to the staff report of the City Council of the City of Menlo Park, ordering the submission to the qualified electors of the City of Menlo Park, a citizen-sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan, establishing the schedule for submission of ballot arguments and authorizing and requesting the County of San Mateo conduct the election. And that motion and that attachment is made with the following changes to the resolution at attachment B. The second to last recital will read, whereas the city council of the city of Menlo Park resolves to submit the initiative to the voters at the general election to be held on November 8th, 2022. And section six of the resolution will be revised to read in full as follows. Submission of ballot arguments. The city council hereby adopts provisions for the filing of ballot arguments and rebuttal arguments for the initiative set forth in California Elections Code 9282. All arguments for and against the measure shall be filed with the city clerk no later than August 14, 2022 at 5 p.m. All other timelines set forth in the County of San Mateo's election calendar for the November 8th, 2022 general election, which is attached here to as exhibit B shall apply. Such timelines include the 10 town calendar day examination review period shall begin on August 9th, 2022 at 5 p.m. and end on August 29th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Rebuttal arguments for measures where a primary argument was filed both in favor and against are due on August 29th, 2022 at 5 p.m. All arguments for and against the measure shall provide copies of the documentation set forth in Elections Code Section 9287B and shall be signed with printed names and signatures of the authors submitting it or have submitted on behalf of an organization the name of the organization and the printed name and signature of at least one of its principal office officers who is the author of the argument. Thank you, City Attorney. Any further city council question or discussion? I just wanted to make sure that the date was changed um, so that the all of the relevant dates are changed um, for when the arguments are to be submitted. I heard the August 9th and I wanted to make, I, I'm sorry, I was unable to follow all of the that. Old, I just old, wanted to sorry. make sure that it's correct. And I don't actually, as long as you say it's correct, I'm good. The only date that is being changed is the submission of ballot arguments for and against the measure. The county calendar has it due August 19th and the council's proposal is to have it due August 14th. That's the only date that's being changed. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Regular business. Under regular business, the city council considers recommendations from staff on policy matters or administrative matters that require city council approval. The first regular business item is K1, authorize the city manager to execute an amendment to the professional services agreement with Team Sheeper Inc. for continued operation of Burgess Pool through August 31st, 2023. To introduce the item is Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhart. Madam Mayor, Madam yes. Mayor, I need to recuse myself from this item. My son, while 16, uh, works at Tim, Tim uh, for, for uh, Mr. Sheeper as a lifeguard and has for the last, uh, last few years. He actually grew up through those programs. And so uh, 
wouldn't want and didn't want to deny him that summer job though in the future may <laughs> uh but but nonetheless um it's over the amount allowed for me to go ahead and participate in these deliberations and i also happen to be on the east coast where it's now very late and uh, need to re-enter my family's hotel room so i'm gonna be excusing myself from the evening for the rest of the evening if that's all right with everyone That is fine. Um, with given that, and given the time at this point, and that we are um, still have a closed session item after this, I am going to ask um, other council members whether they have any problem with um, continuing item K two, the waiving the reading and introducing an ordinance for the process for obtaining film permits to the following meeting. Is there any? Concern from council members about that, Vice Mayor Wollison. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I also um, am in a different time zone. Um, whatever we can continue would be appreciated. I know that the um, swimming contract obviously is critical to get done, but thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So we will continue the K two. We will currently. Um, here K1 and we will have the closed session following the K1 and the information item. Thank you. So Library and Community Services Director Sean Reinhardt, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, in acknowledgement of the lateness of the hour, I will be brief. On July 12th, Team Sheeper informed city staff that they are amenable to extending the current agreement's duration for 12 months ending August 31st, 2023, without the possibility of ending the agreement sooner than August 31st, 2023, due to the opening of the new Menlo Park Community Campus facility. Um, Sheeper, uh, Team Sheeper also informed city staff that um, they will withdraw their request to remove Burgess Pool from the upcoming request for proposals. Staff believes that this proposal is substantively consistent with city council direction received on February 8th and reiterated on June 28th. And city staff recommends that the city council accept the proposal and authorize the city manager to execute a third amendment to the agreement with these terms as uh, outlined in attachment A. I do want to acknowledge that um, from Team Sheeper Inc, uh, Tim Sheeper and Steve Young from that organization are here in the gallery. And that concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to Mr. Sheeper and Mr. Young for hanging in there um, through the evening. Do you have any comments at this point that you'd like to make? No need to, just if you, I wanted to give you the opportunity since you were here. No, good. Um, in that case, um, City Clerk Karen, please call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item K-1, authorize the city manager to execute an amendment to the professional services agreement with Team Sheeper Inc. for continued operation of Burgess Pool through August 31st, 2023. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. For members of the public participating in person, we ask that you step up to the podium at this time. Our first speaker will be Paul Kalachi. Kalachi. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> I had the um, distinct pleasure of serving on the referendum group or the initiative group or whatever measure T group that created the bond measure that resulted in the swimming pool and all the other facilities that Menlo Park was able to enjoy. <clears throat> An interesting fact about that was that outside of maybe a half a dozen elected and former elected officials and a couple of industrious citizens. We actually had very little citizen support in running the, in running the measure. There were two groups of people that supported us from citizens. One were individuals associated with the Menlo Children's Center and another group of individuals were individuals associated with the Solo Swim Group. Of, of all the things I have no regrets on any decision I made as a council member, 
but two of the regrets and the only thing that I might lose sleep over are the fact that I felt that commitments and promises that we implicitly made to those two groups of people were not fulfilled. Um, I have no comment to make whatsoever over the way the pool was run by Mr. Sheeper. I hear all sorts of great and wonderful things. Um, I have always regretted the possibility that a public swimming pool, which is a beautiful facility, may under the arrangement be somehow partly privatized. And I've also worried about the fact that, and I don't know what the facts are, but that Solo may not have gotten to enjoy the use of the pool. And so those are the two things I'd like to express. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Tom McCray. Hi, I'm Tom McCray. I'm the coach of Solo Aquatics, and um, and yeah, I'm in uh, I'm in favor of uh, Team Sheeper continuing to run the pool. It's interesting the last comments because um, because part of the agreement with supporting Tim Sheeper running the program at no cost to the city was that Solo would actually get access to the pools once the facility was done. Uh, one of the one of the pools being the warm pool for our younger children. And that has never been fulfilled, and so it's it's disheartening that uh, we've been we've been at this getting a pool and uh, and running. Solo's been there since 1994, and with this whole process, of hoping that uh, we get to an RFP again. Solo bid on the last RFP, and we actually, as a result, had uh, lost some pool space and and these other things. But I met with Tim in April and tried to uh, work on a future arrangement, and he said, "Hey, you know what? Once we get to January, we'll have a discussion." But again, way long overdue in terms of uh, equitable kind of situation there. So we're in support of, of Tim uh, continuing to operate the facility. Just uh, really looking at the fact that the RFP should be done well in advance. And after we bid the last RFP, when the, the time had elapsed, I approached the city manager who basically said, Tim is the only qualified person. And so therefore it was uh, something that was just said, hey, let us know if you have any concerns. None of those have ever been addressed. And uh, and and lastly, being able to look at it and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I've, I've been here for a really long time. And as these things are, are presented that, uh, you know, it's kind of like after the fact that I'm uh, learning that, hey, this is happening or that's happening uh, with the facility. I was part of the major T. I was part of the design. And um, so it's just kind of like, hey, I've been here the, the entire time. And I think that there's some great things coming up and uh, with the new RFP. But the language in the staff report said that it could be shut down until 2023. And I talked to um, Mr. Murphy and, uh, and I, I spoke at city council saying that, you know what, hey, Solo has been here, Solo has bid, and, uh, and, and we used to run MA's pool for 12 years, and so it's just one of those things that when we have language coming from staff saying, hey, it could shut down, that it continues the fear element, and, uh, and again, in support of Tim running the pool right now, and, uh, and look forward to an RFP process that really takes into account the needs of, of the facility and the new upcoming facility. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Last call for public comment on item K1. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And thank you to Mr. Kalachi and Mr. McCray for all of your service. And um, we look forward to the RFP um, in the future also with uh, Mr. Sheeper. So we are now open for city council discussion. Council member Combs. Um, th thank you, uh, um, Mayor Nash. And I know given the lateness, I'll, I'll make the motion um, uh, and as part of the agenda item, but I do have to also pose the question to either Mr. Reinhardt or, or, or Mr. Schieber who, who was available. Um, given that like this is, the, the proposal, um, an extension that is essentially, was essentially tied with an RFP uh, that would uh, uh, encompass both pools. Um, given that, th that this was what was proposed to Mr. Sheeper some months ago um, and, and was rejected and, and, and what we got back was that, that he really needed to have a, a more long-term uh, contract with the city 
um, how is it now that that this uh, proposal, which was so untenable, um, the last time it was presented became became tenable? I think uh, get, given all of the discussion um, uh, among the community, um, I, I think that that it, it is fair, and, and I actually feel some obligation to to ask that question again, even as I make the motion um, uh, for for the contract to be executed. Thank you for the question, Councilmember Combs. Um, I believe that um, briefly it was a result of the conversation that ensued. Uh, especially after June 28th. And I think, um, you know, that resulted in um, basically coming to terms. Thank you. And I will second the motion. Would anyone else like to comment? All right, thank you. Um, City Clerk Heron, could you please state the motion and call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Combs and a second by Mayor Nash to authorize the city manager to execute an amendment to the professional services agreement between the City of Menlo Park and Team Cheaper Inc. for continued operation of Burgess Pools as follows. One, Section 3 of the agreement date March 27, 2018 is repealed in its entirety and replaced with the following language. The term of this agreement shall terminate August 31st, 2023. And number two, except to the extent expressively modified by this third amendment, the terms of this agreement as amended by the first amendment and the second amendment shall remain in effect without impairment or modification. And number three, this third amendment may be executed in counterparts, each of which shall be deemed an original, but all of which will, all which when taken together shall constitute one amendment. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Mueller recused. Thank you. And now we will move on to informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Heron, do we have any public comments on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item L1, city council, city council agenda topics, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And this will be the final call for public comment on item L1. Seeing none, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. And do we need to vote to continue past 11? If we can't make it through city manager report, city council reports, or public comment on closed session, we should before 11. Okay, let's um, vote because I wish we could do it in one minute, but I doubt if we can. Um, is there any objection to continuing past 11 to finish this agenda? I'm actually going to, uh, Mayor Nash, I'm going to be logging off, um, but I feel like these last items are in good hands. So I appreciate there being a majority of council still present, if that, if that works. Thank you, Vice Mayor Willison. I appreciate okay, that, you. knowing you're on the East Coast. Okay, thank you very much. Good night. Councilmember Taylor, Councilmember Combs, are you... Okay, with continuing past 11. Yes, I'm here to the end. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Um, are there any city council questions on any of the info items? All right. Um, we now move to the city manager's report, and I'd like to introduce acting city manager, police chief Dave Norris. I promise to try and keep it to about 25 seconds if I can. 
Um, I, I only have three items and most of them are fairly selfish towards the police department actually, but uh, the first item is not. And I just wanted to thank uh, the council as well as city staff. <clears throat> I was supposed to be acting city manager last week and I was unable to due to uh, family emergency. So I just wanna show my appreciation for the rest of the staff for uh, filling in the gaps and, and uh, taking over and, and, uh, and helping me out last week. Um, second item is uh, a reminder on National Night Out. It is next week, Tuesday, August 2nd. Uh, we're looking forward to multiple block parties throughout the city and, uh, and a good night um, for all. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And then uh, just to kind of uh, add to the Environmental Quality Commission's report from earlier today, our three Tesla vehicles are about ready to go live within the next month. So they're in their final stages of, of preparation and we've been working very hard with our public works department on getting the, at least the, the temporary infrastructure in place to, uh, to get those ready to go. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. Very exciting, thank you. Are there any reports from city council members since the July 12th city council meeting? City Clerk Heron, could you please call for public comment on the closed session item 01? Can do. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our closed session item 01, which is a closed session uh, pursuant to government code related to two liability claims, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our final closed session item 01. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And um, with that, I will adjourn the meeting and we will um, move to closed session. Thank you.